Ginger, that's what you need. A mouthful of the good stuff and you'll see the back of any seasickness. Oh, thank you for your support, John. Don't suppose you actually brought any ginger? No, I don't get seasick. Terrific. Don't worry, Sherry. We've almost arrived at Cordona. I can see land through the porthole. So much for docking by tea time. The captain seemed more interested in his maids than in his maps. Oh, he sure looked grumpy. Cheer up. We're back where we grew up. It's exciting. What's changed? What's the same? Ugh. I'm starting to question whether the weeks-long journey was worth it. Traveling all this way, enduring this indignity simply to visit a grave. Even if it is my mother's. Ah, that's just Mycroft's nonsense, still rattling around in your head. Try to forget what he said. I have. I believe it was that this is a performative farce, a feeble excuse to avoid responsibilities, and that there was nothing to be gained from it. You needed to do this. Enough of the self-pity and doubt. So we're a little late. What of it? We'll retire to the hotel and visit her in the morning. It'll be worth it. Thank you, John. And if you want to notify the captain's wife of his indiscretions, I will not stand in your way. Ah, oh, at last. I'm quite ready to get off this cursed boat. Come on. We'll go together. Would you kindly sign these papers, sir? There you are. Ah, Mr. Holmes. Uh, yes, we have room 221 prepared for you. I see it was reserved for two people. Uh, would you like a second key? Oh, uh, no. I, I think we'll stick together. Very good. Rooms are upstairs, sir. Welcome to Cordona. Hurry up, Sherlock. I want to see our room. I hope there's a balcony. I apologize, sir, but your room is not yet ready. Perhaps, in the meantime, you would like to relax in the foyer? Tonight, the restaurant is offering a complimentary Marlin ceviche to all our guests. Let's check what they have on offer. A medium, John. Haven't we been through this already? Come on, it's not like we've got anything better to do. Excuse me, sir, but I believe Mr. Galich is conducting a seance at the moment. Perhaps you'd care to have your portrait drawn while you wait? Why? Pardon me. Why should I sit for a portrait? I... Sir, it's art. It doesn't need a why. It is its own justification. All things require justification, be they objects, systems, or beliefs. How about art as the lens through which we see the truth of the world? That's backward. Truth is not subjective and not complicated. It's just the truth. It either is or it isn't. You do not need a lens to see it, just an open mind. Ha! Huh. That seems rather close-minded. Truth, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. So tell me, what do you see? Mediocrity. Come now, Sherry. What did he do to deserve that? The servant mentioned ceviche at the bar, Sherry. You should grab us some, and I'll find us a table. I'm starving. Okay, time to check if John found us a nice table for the evening. Sherry, I'm over here with my new ursine. Cordon is even quieter than I remembered. It's going to be a long evening. Ah, come now, Sherry. What say we amuse ourselves with a little game? What were you thinking? Oh, promise me it isn't nonsense. After being cooped up on that boat, I am itching for activity. No. As you can see, someone left a cane on our table. I simply thought you could identify its owner. Ah, so it is nonsense. It'll take me a minute, John, at most. Well then, 
You can deliver it to him as well. Deliver it to him? <laughs> then what are the staff here for? Aesthetics? Oh, stubborn, Sherry. Too stubborn. You wanted something to do. Slapping oneself in the face is also something to do. That doesn't make it worthwhile. But all right. Let me take a look. This cane is an expensive and ostentatious weapon. Its owner must be vain, volatile, and of noble English blood. Take it with you, Sherry. Let's return it to its owner. All right. I hope you noted down your observations in your casebook. But how are you going to find this nobleman? The cane itself is not enough. I may have to ask other guests if they saw who was here. This hotel, this island, it's full of thieves! First my cane, now the diamond. Take your hands off me! Do you even know who I am? Hey boy! That's my cane! I get that a lot, it's a very common design. What? No, that's a custom made! A joke! A joke. It was left at my table in the restaurant. I thought it deserved to be returned. Well, I'll be... It is rare to encounter a straight-fingered true penny these days. What a gentleman. But I must ask, how did you know I was the rightful owner? Simple deduction. Your cane told me everything. I was after a British noble who takes boxing lessons but suffers from some liver issues. And if one were to go further, one may even be able to extrapolate your name from your heraldic symbol, Lord Craven. Well, you're half correct. I am indeed Lord Andrew Craven. Your other guesses were wrong, but you still have the edge over that blasted medium. Well, you found my cane. Perhaps you can locate my diamond, too. Yes, you should do it. It will be child's play for you, Mr... Holmes. And if a child can do it, then I'm sure the local police can suffice. The police? Why bother? I know this Harlequin stole it. The only question is, where is it hidden? Fine. Give me my stick and I'll resolve the matter myself. This thief almost confessed after a single punch. Hm. I suspect a beating may result in answers of questionable veracity. Fine. I shall spare you and he the trouble if you first answer me this. You insist the medium robbed you during the seance. But what occurred exactly? Ah! It was a dirty trick. We were sitting here in the dark, chanting and holding hands, as expected. Then something began to appear from the medium, like a, a cloud or a bubble. The swindler called it ectoplasm. Ah, yes. Common in the spiritualist trade, and quite the spectacle. Indeed. Perhaps too much. My beloved Emma screamed in horror, and I stood to defend her, attacking that cursed ghost. How brave. But my hand hit nothing. The medium jumped away from me, and Emma fainted. I lit the candle, and the diamond was gone. How does a priceless diamond become the subject of a seance? It is an unusual accoutrement. Emma wished to speak with its former owners. My grandfather told us it belonged to a Raja, an Indian king. So you were summoning long-dead Indian royalty, and, pray tell, you were expecting him to converse in English? To be frank, Mr. Holmes, I don't believe in ghosts. But Emma was fascinated by the idea of meeting a real king, even a dead one. Well, a crown is a crown. Can you describe the stone itself? A yellow diamond, not less than a hundred carats, and perfectly egg-shaped. There is not another like it. Stay here, and don't touch anything. I'm going to investigate further. Don't fret, I'll be keeping a close eye on this thief. What happened here? I don't know. The ghost. I summoned it as usual, but then it all went wrong. The lady screamed and pointed at Lord Craven. And there was a shadow. Such a mystical force. It terrified the lady. And it must have taken the diamond. Who else could have? Do you feel the presence of any supernatural entities at the moment? Are you joking, sir? My nose is broken, this maniac wants to kill me, and you're asking about the spirits? I suppose this can wait. I will investigate, and the culprit will be identified.
but the stubborn brute Lord Craven blames me right now. As if I could do something like that. Uh, perhaps you can reason with him, please? It all began when the lady screamed and pointed at the window. Lord Craven jumped up, ready to face anything, ghost or human. The medium shrank back in dismay. He was not expecting such a reaction and had to quickly hide the ghost. The lady was the only one left touching the diamond, at least until she fainted. Amazing! It's like you saw it with your own eyes, sir. Oh, I forgot that you were here. I guess I should discuss all of this with Lady Craven. The Cravens are upstairs in room 226. It is one of our finest suites. If the lady was touching a diamond, then she would have felt the ghost take it. What do you think it felt like, Sherry? A jellyfish? You're here, at last. I didn't do that. I swear, I found her this way. Well, I did have some questions for her, but it seems I've arrived too late. Now it's a matter for the police. Mr. Holmes, you said it yourself. They're children. They'll only make things worse. You, you promised me you would investigate. Investigate a theft, not a murder. Fear not. I will tell them all I've uncovered. Please, help me. The police will surely accuse me of Emma's death. You are the only one who can find the truth. Fine, but only because it's slightly more interesting than the walls of my room. Tell me what happened. Look, after you left, I waited in the seance room until the servants locked up Mr. Galici the medium. And was your mistress there too? Oh, so you... you know? I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. Regardless, the staff took Emma to her room. She was still feeling dizzy. So you didn't follow her. Interesting. Is Mr. Galici still being held, and where did the servants secure him? He's in room 225, but that pigeon-livered man at the reception desk refused to give me the key. Well, I will have to visit reception myself, then. Perhaps he will listen to reason. Where did you go instead? To the bar. It had been almost an hour. I see. And how long did you stay? I partook of a well-earned whiskey or two before retiring upstairs. Ask anyone there. Now we arrive at the tragedy at hand. So what transpired after your detour to the bar? I headed up to my room to find Emma on the bed. I didn't pay her much attention at first. I was still preoccupied with that damned medium. But when I realized she was silent, I drew closer and discovered she was dead. What's more, the diamond lay right there beside her. Oh, well, that is splendid news. Splendid? The return of the diamond will be cold comfort if I live out my days in a jail cell. You must help me. Let me see what I can find. Barely an hour has passed, and you already have yourself a murder mystery, Sherlock. Why am I not surprised? I found these jewels secreted away. Are you familiar with them? Ah, oh, it cannot be so. That deceptive wagtail. How could she do this? That sounds like a yes. These items were supposedly stolen from us during our trip. I must have spent hours reporting it all to the police. And it turns out she had them all along. The trollop. I'd kill her myself were she not dead already. Do you recognize this ring? Should I? That's a third-rate piece if ever I've seen one. I'd never buy something like this. Did you ever see Miss Emma wearing it? No. And why should she? I gave her enough jewelry that she could wear a superior ring every day of the week. Give me the key to Luca Galici's room. I need to talk to him about the events of the seance. I suppose you are an impartial outsider. All right, but please do not give it to Lord Craven. We do not want to see our reputation damaged further. Awkward. They still don't know what a nasty surprise awaits upstairs. Hush. No need to cause another ruckus. The last thing we want is the police to come meddling. I'm afraid I can wait no longer to hear your account of the seance, Mr. Galici. So please, tell me what you saw. Lady Craven wanted to meet the spirit of the Raja. My conjuration was successful. Perhaps even too successful. I am sure the spirit was the only one who could have taken the diamond. 
Lord Craven needs to leave me alone. Do you think the police will believe you? Of course. I didn't take anything. And spiritual phenomena are beyond their control. Or should I summon the ghost again so they may attempt to handcuff it? I think I would prefer to begin my investigation in the physical realm. I have shocking news that changes your situation entirely. Oh, no, wait. What am I thinking? The spirits will have told you this already. Uh, I'm not in the necessary state for summoning. The spirits prefer clarity of mind and soul. Please, tell me. Lady Craven died in the very next room while you were in here. Did you not hear anything? What? How? I... In fact, I did hear noises. That Craven is a very loud man. But I never thought he would do that to his wife. Well, you claim to be a medium. Perhaps you could ask her spirit why. What? No, it's uh, too dangerous. Oh well, at least I can make the dead talk. Do you realize just how dangerous it is to hold phosphorus in the mouth? I beg your pardon? I'll bet it makes your rubber balloons glow impressively in the dark, but you'll regret it when the hypertension and vomiting sets in. You mock my talent, sir. You shouldn't be so flippant about things beyond your earthly understanding. How ignorant one must be to compare a spirit's ectoplasm with balloons. It was merely a word of caution. We both know how match factory workers look after several years on the job. That's a remarkable pin of yours, Mr. Galici. Does it have any meaning? The butterfly? It's a reminder of a time in which I was truly happy. What a coincidence. Lady Craven had a ring with the same design. A coincidence indeed. <laughs> I suspect it is a common theme in jewellery. Those scratches on your hands look rather painful. What happened to you? It was those savage servants. They were so rough bringing me here as if I was trying to escape. When I'm free, I'll demand compensation. Luca Galici, I know you murdered Lady Craven, and I can prove it. That would be a grand story for the newspapers. But where's your proof? I was locked in here and could not hurt a fly. As for the motive, it's obvious that you deduced that Lady Craven was the real thief. Of course, it helped that this was not your first encounter with Miss Emma. I am... Uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. How on earth can you believe this? I think the police will easily find the proof when they browse their archives. Your wrists are bloodied, and there's no way a servant's manhandling could cause such an injury. It was Lady Craven as you strangled her. You are... You are fantasizing, Mr. Holmes. Yes, yes, the locked room. Good of you to mention it. I inspected the door between the rooms, and the lock on it is piteous. You could open it with a penknife. So I am now a burglar, as well as a thief and a murderer? It is done, Luca. You will be arrested. Your best strategy now is to confess and hope your reasons were justified. I... Uh, I... Ha. <sighs> I don't know how you figured it out, but yes, I killed her, I had to. This woman could not get away with ruining my life twice. Twice? I knew Emma before she was a lady. I mean, she pretended to be noble back then too, but only so our gang, the moths, could steal from those snobs. She betrayed us, stole all our money and disappeared, leaving us to rot in jail. I was young, I spent three years in that hell, and tonight, she tried to set you up again. Did she recognize you? She didn't. I came to her afterwards, pleading that she drop this farce, but she laughed in my face. I just remembered my time in the clink. All I suffered while she indulged. Then I grabbed her throat. Murder is murder, Luca. You could have told Lord Craven the truth and seen Miss Emma's downfall, but you could not restrain yourself. He would never believe me. We will never know. Still, perhaps a jury will be more easily swayed. If not, you'll get to see your friends in jail again soon. We'll meet again, Holmes. I will get you, in this life or the next.
Get your hands off me! He murdered the woman who put him in jail. Should we be worried? Fear not, John. Unlike Miss Emma, I will see him coming. That was too much fun, Sherry. I'm buzzing. Buzzing. Wasn't it fun? A woman died, John. I was too slow to the truth, too hesitant to intervene. How can you... Oh, lighten up. Those people made their choices. If you swan about with a diamond in your pocket, that's what happens. Wealth is a weakness, so we must blame those who covet it. With enough money on the line, Sherlock, a man will do just about anything, even murder. And then we get to solve it. I suspect you perhaps cannot grasp the true horrors of mortality, John. Oi, I am aware of my perilous existence, thank you very much. Mm, I must admit, even if the outcome of the adventure was imperfect, there was some pleasure to be had in the puzzle. Well, Cordona seems more depraved and decadent than we thought. I bet you'll get another chance. A bet, you say? A uh, figure of speech. Just a figure of speech. Ah, <sighs> damn. Well, take one last look at the view, then we must be off. It's time to do what we came here for. Is everything all right? If you don't feel up to it, I won't tell anyone. It's just a goodbye, John. It won't be difficult. I've already come to terms with my mother's passing. Hmm. So you really don't remember? To what do you refer? The funeral. Sherlock, you were distraught. At first, I thought this visit would dredge up those feelings, but you've been remarkably level. John, I think I was too young to understand. I couldn't fathom why she would leave me. Perhaps that pain is best left forgotten. On the contrary, it's why I'm visiting her grave. To remember her. Pocket watch? It seems familiar, John. Why is it here? This watch was a gift. My mother's initials are engraved on it. The piece is in good condition. It must have been placed here only recently. Oh, it's that ridiculous artist from the hotel. Be nice, Sherry. Make friends. Mr. Holmes, did you come for another portrait? <laughs> no, no, I jest. You gave quite the performance last night. The hotel was abuzz with your name. I must say I was rather absorbed in it all. The fallibility of men. Such scandal. It was a welcome distraction. Oh, my manners. I am Werner Vogel, art enthusiast and gallery proprietor. Mr. Vogel, I was perhaps too curt when last we spoke. Speak no more of it. Travel takes it out of any man, never mind when this is your destination. Once I learned who you were, the pieces fell into place. Your mother was well liked on Cadona in her time here. I was sorry to hear of her passing. How did you come to possess my mother's pocket watch? Oh my! It is quite something to witness those powers of deduction firsthand. Yes, I... I left you her timepiece. After her death, there was an estate sale. All of Cordona's elite picking of her remains. I couldn't let such a lovely thing go to those vultures. When I learned your name, I could no longer keep the watch in good conscience. It is yours by right, and I knew you'd find it here. Thank you. I'd forgotten all about it, but the moment I saw it, I knew it was hers. Amazing what the young mind forgets and the older can recall. Rather odd, loitering in a cemetery. I suspect you'll win, but I'm here for my art. There's beauty everywhere if you look, even in decay. A little darkness brings out the light. Now, a diligent observer might note that you too are loitering in a cemetery. What brings you here? Closure answers penance? Closure, I suppose. 
And what is closure? Mere proximity? Understanding. Acceptance. You didn't understand from afar. You had to come here to accept the truth of her death? Of course I understand. She died of consumption, drowning in her own blood. Your mother? Yes, my mother. Hmm. I must have been misinformed. I'd heard otherwise. Otherwise than consumption? No, no. You'd know better than I. I'd heard talk of a police investigation, but Cordona is a notorious gossip. And what does it matter? She's passed on either way. She has. Well, I shall intrude no longer. I'll leave you to your closure. Do stop by the gallery if your travels permit. Farewell. Are you all right, Sherry? Take as long as you need. Hmm. Whatever I need, it isn't here. We should explore Cordona. Perhaps there are archives that may shed further light. Stark do this, Stark do that. I'm not a clerk, damn it. How am I supposed to get those records now? Yes, what is it? Would you like to report a crime? No, I wouldn't. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I want to use the police archives. Wouldn't we all? I'm serious. So am I. Officer Logan locked himself inside and he's not letting anyone in. What happened exactly? A tailoress from Scaladio has been robbed. Logan spent two whole days at the shop sketching the thief and she still insists that it's all wrong. That shrew drove him up the wall, she did. Would you mind if I talk to this tailoress? I could get you the sketch in no time. Get off your high horse, mister. You think you're better than our sketch artist? Actually, I'm quite certain I am. Let me prove it. Well, I see no harm in it, as long as it gets Logan out of there. In fact, I need to look up some records too. Here's the address. Good luck. I'm pleased to meet you, ma'am. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm here to sketch the thief for the police investigation. Oh, what another one. I hope you'll be more patient than the previous sketches, signore. Can you describe the thief for me? He was all ugly and beat up looking. An utter rascal, if ever I'd seen one. He gave me a nasty look from behind his glasses and then made himself scarce. And that's it? Could you be more specific? He was a total villain, I told you. How much more specific do you want me to be? All right, never mind. I suggest we do it differently. You have a great many clothes here, haven't you? Why, of course, but they're not for sale. I only do tailoring and mending. No matter. I'll attempt to disguise myself as the thief, and you'll tell me if I get it right. As you wish, Signor Holmes. Where can I find the clothes? They're in my workshop, at the back. Uh, be careful, won't you? Ah! It's you! I mean, it's him! It's him! Excellent. Now I can make a sketch and take it to the police. Yes, please do. That rascal is still on the loose. I hope they are better at catching than sketching. Before I go, Mom, are you quite certain that you don't have any clothes to sell? Well, I suppose you can take the police uniform. An officer forgot it here years ago and I don't have any use for it. If you want to buy clothes, visit the Outfitters. You can find them all over Codorna. I hear they even do free rentals now. Let me show you where the nearest one is. Thank you very much. Hello again, officer. I've spoken to the tailoress and made a sketch of the thief. It was child's play. No, really? And she didn't give you any trouble? No, no trouble at all. She was quite tolerable. Huh. Who would have thought? Hey, Logan, we've got the sketch. Come on out. Can I use the archives now? Well, they're generally not accessible to the public. But you really helped us out, so I'll just turn a blind eye. I appreciate it, officer. What did you say your name was? Holmes? Come and see me after you're done. I may have a proposition for you, Mr Holmes. <sighs> John, I just recalled that we were living here on Cordona, in a manor, and there was a policeman. Really? What else do you remember? What happened to our mother? The memory was vague, a, a mere flash. I have to find our house. Absolutely. Let's do it. I'm done with the archives for now. Can I help you with anything else? As a matter of fact, you can. The thing is, our chief inspector has vanished, as if we weren't undermanned enough as it is. 
Wait, what do you mean, vanished? Gone missing on a case. Shady business, but that's besides the point. See that board? Pending cases are posted there for any available officers to investigate. I would take them myself, except that I've been told to work the reception desk, like some clerk. Yes, we're that short-handed. I understand your predicament, but what does any of it have to do with me? I may be available, but I'm certainly not an officer. Oh, don't worry about it. Consider yourself a temporary one-man independent police force. That's a bit of a mouthful. There's just one small, minor, basic formality. You'll need to complete our physical training course. Easy. Well, I'm not one to balk at a spot of exercise. What must I do? Ask the spirit. Sergeant Ermy will show you the ropes. Follow me. So, you're a newcomer. We must be desperate to ask untrained civilians for help. You're lucky to have a well-trained civilian with a brand new auto pistol in his arsenal. An automatic? A bit of a braggart, aren't you? Are you trying to test me already? That is why you're here, boy. I need to verify your skills before I can allow you to catch criminals. The first targets are in the next room. You know what to do with them. I'll join you in a while to see the results. That's enough. You've proved yourself. Congratulations on the arrests. I can't believe you did so well with the close combat. I did tell you that I'm well trained. Well, do the same on the street and you'll be well rewarded for every arrest you make. Here is your certificate. You are now an authorized crime scene consultant. Well, it's now your duty to make this city a safer place. Cordona won't ever forget it, but at the same time, it will never remember. I'll tell Stark all the necessary details about your successful certification. Congratulations. Now you're a certified crime scene consultant. Congratulations. Thank you, my friend. Now, shall we head for Stonewood Manor? Don't know. You have the whole island to investigate. It's all up to you. There she is. Our old manor. It's smaller than I remember. You were a couple of feet shorter back then, Sherry. Or maybe it's bigger on the inside. Look at the ash all over the door. I don't recall hearing of a fire. We don't have to stay here. You can afford another night or two at the hotel. Hmm. It's stuck. Oh well, let's just head back. They probably haven't even stripped our room yet. Come on. <clears throat> must be locked. Move aside. Let me have a go. Seems fine to me, Sherry. This barrier, perhaps it's mental, not physical. Or perhaps the rest of us are simply constrained by reality, John. I wonder if there's a key secreted somewhere in the garden. Try to recall that memory about the policeman, Sherry. Concentrate. Mycroft wasn't happy about the fact that we were arrested. It felt like he lectured us for hours. Did we give him something afterwards, Sherry? Oh, yes. Yes, now I remember. It was a letter. That's why we snuck into the house. Mycroft asked us to. He wasn't angry we stole, but that we got caught. Oh, that's right. It must have been only a couple of months after we moved to Cordona. Oh, the good old days. Whoa. How very odd. It appears that memory stood between me and the manor. It, it's as if my mind palace had seeped into the real world. This deserves further investigation. Perhaps there's more to discover inside. As long as there is a comfortable place to put my feet up, I'll be happy. Maybe a chaise longue. Aha! In we go. Another memory incoming, Sherry. Strange. I struggle to recall anything about the day we moved in. The only detail I'm sure of is that it was raining early that morning. Our mother brought a slew of belongings with her. She refused to leave a single thing in London. Mycroft had to spend the whole day dealing with it. This trip was a challenge for our mother. I tried to help her. Your neighbors will be told that Mrs. Holmes is suffering from tuberculosis. It is common to move closer to the sea in such cases. Thank you, Dr. Rector. No, Sherlock, step away from her! Upstairs, go to your room. Lean on me, Mother. Take your time. Actually, I never heard her coughing. I remember now.
Oh, I feel dizzy. It's stuffy in here, isn't it? John, are you all right? I'll be okay in a minute. <clears throat> How about we uh, find our room in the meantime? Oh, oh, it reminds me of our neighbor. He had the same balloon in his yard, only bigger. Do you remember? Yes. We visited him several times while living here. Wasn't that neighbor missing a finger? That does sound vaguely familiar. Wasn't his name, uh, Theodore? Theodore Gilden, perhaps? It's the perfect time to investigate. A missing pinky, middle-aged. It's none other than Theodore Gilden. Oh boy, Sherlock. Another death means another question. And we shall answer the question. It's far too interesting to give it up to the police. In a fit of rage, the elephant broke the chain and threw its victim on the ground with a fierce power. Escaping the scene, it pulled the body with it, but dropped it at the gate. At least some of this was witnessed by a third party who was hurled against the shed. You! Who are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Theodore Gilden was... Did you kill him? Did you kill the elephant? It's not in the yard anymore. It escaped into the forest. You can't let it go. What if it returns? I highly doubt that, miss. Imogen Gildon. Please, I beg of you. Find that dreadful beast that killed my father. I suppose we do need to learn what happened. Can you tell me what happened? From the very start. I was here, so I didn't see how it began. My father visits the enclosure every morning to wake up Goliath. Today, I heard the elephant scream. I've never heard such a horrifying sound. My heart stopped. I knew something was wrong. I looked through my window and saw how it... How it lifted my father up by his neck. I rushed downstairs. I saw it dragging my father as if he were a doll. I threw stones at it. It dropped my father's body and charged outside, screaming. Its roar was almost human. I was frightened, so I ran inside and hid here. Well, it was the most probable outcome, living with a giant wild animal such as that. How can you be so cold? Goliath murdered my father, Mr. Holmes. He mustn't be allowed to get away with it. Well, thank you for the information, Miss Gilden. I did have some questions for your father. Perhaps you might help me with them? I wasn't privy to much of my father's life. And it's very hard to think of anything at all with Goliath still loose. Please, Mr. Holmes. Very well. Do you mind if I ask you more questions if I find anything that might help? Anything to catch that monster. You found false idols. We need to find the remaining two. What does bazooka even mean? Would this paper be good for anything but blowing one's nose on? They're not rubbish, Sherry. There's something more. I'm serious. Very well. I doubt it'll be worth it, but I will find them for you, John. You'll thank me later. They're some of the most imaginative books I've ever read. A. Swift, is this name familiar to you? Your father had it removed from this plan. Oh, that's Arthur Swift. I've seen him a couple of times here. He works with my father in the old city, digging up something ancient. He is an archaeologist? That's the word, yes. But to be truthful, I really don't think Mr. Swift is fit to be one. I've just learnt a lot about archaeology from my favourite book series. Oh, they are page-turners. Inspirational, I'm sure, but would you happen to know where this Mr. Swift might be found? I don't, but perhaps you can find out somewhere. My father's work with him is all official. Lots of boring legal papers with signatures and stuff. And, uh, which part of the elephant is in here? It's quite pungent. Oh, that. It's elephant sweat. Father believed that it might replace traditional amber grease. Well, that's true, entrepreneur. I found this. Who's this young lad next to you, your faithful knight? Paul. He's my pirate. He's not really a pirate. I just call him that. It probably sounds very silly. Your secret is safe in my hands. Does Paul work somewhere? What is his surname? His name is Paul Perks. He and his yacht Whirlpool are the champions of the Salacia Yacht Club. He sails there. I'll show you where it is on the map if you need to meet him. A yachting champion? Huh. Well, that will be a first. 
I prefer dry land, and so does my suit. How can you read something like this? It's hard to swallow, and that's not due to the hard cover. You're hardly serious. Any library without Nabe and Laura is incomplete. If you can read, then these books are an absolute must. Love and adventure. They're about life. Oh, I wasn't aware that exploding pyramids were part of daily life on Cordona. You haven't seen life, so you might try reading about it at least. These bags of yours, it looks as if you've packed your entire room. Were you planning on going somewhere? My partner and I, we wanted a change, a fresh start abroad. But now I have to stay here. Here, an orphan. Oi, hands off my possessions before you lose your fingers. Are you illiterate? The rules are written everywhere. Ah, Mr. Perks, the cabin boy himself. Champion, you mean. I was right. You are illiterate. I think a couple of shiners might teach you. One last chance. Who are you? I am a friend of Theodore Gildon. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I need a few words from you about... Get out of here. I'm not joking. Leave this place before you have cause to regret it. I will use force. Do the police still throw people in prison for smuggling? Oh yes, with you helpless and handcuffed, I'd learn a few more secrets. We don't need to compete with our egos now, surely. Oh no. I'd rather you tell me something more, so that I might have more reasons to punch you out. So, a woman wishes to become a real criminal, and smuggling is a stepping stone towards that? Is there not enough prestige in yachting? Or, is it easier to compete with other fools like yourself? Everyone has a starting pistol, just shoot and run. Don't say a word. I don't know where you're getting half of this nonsense, but you're on some thin ice here that I'm willing to crack. Damn you, Paul. I'm sick of... Who's this peacock? Does he know who I am? I definitely know who you are not. You're not a dictionary reader, at least. I wanted to see how you... pals interact with each other in your natural habitat. But I'm afraid I have to interfere. Don't bother moving. You've lost. And there's no reward for risking our lives. Paul's explanation will suffice. From day to night. Sir, kind sir, might I steal your attention? I am not buying. Ah, that is the thing. You won't waste a single mangir. I am a digger, you see, and I have heard of a dig site so deep it clogs your ears. I want to be there. Why are you telling me this? I have heard of a man recruiting for such a dig. A man with a scar, such as uh, the one that you're hiding. And your boots are dirty with the deep clay I am so familiar with. Oh, I, I hope it wasn't too rude of me to point that out. You have a good eye. And you just want to dig? Dig deep and that's it? What's the catch? Are you in desperate need of money? Oh, there is no catch, sir. I won't even ask for advance pay. Just give me a shovel and I'll dig a hole like you've never seen. Huh. Is that so? Well, I have to ask you an important question first. Would you be fine working for Brits? The English? Uh, no. Is there anyone here who still likes them? Ugh, another one. Get lost. If only I could slap you. Wait, wait. No, I was uh, just testing the ground. It can be dangerous to talk about politics here. Then prove that you're fine with them. All right? I'll sing you a very special song. God save our gracious queen. Cut it! Or people here will make you their queen. I can also speak in limericks. Please don't. 
You might be a little bit weak in the head, but a natural born digger with a keen eye is what we need. Take this permission slip and go to this address. The guard will let you in and check with the professor once you're there. Stop loitering and get inside. Where's the fire in your eyes? Where's the smile? I am sick and tired of seeing apathy among the new workers. Sir, believe me, I do have the spark. I want to start work straight away. It's as important to me as it is to you. Ah, that's the spirit. I'm on the verge of a great discovery. Uh, when was the last time you saw... So Young man, you're disappointing me. I'd like to see a bright career for you as the best digger on the island. Don't ruin it. We'll talk when you find something useful. I am ready to work. Splendid. Do you know what I am working on? Archaeological treasure. Ah, uh, you're hoping to find something priceless, something that will change our history. Bravo, young man. I couldn't have said it better myself. It's true. We're looking for Vitus Lemonius's tomb. I'll help you. That is my goal as a worker. Good. Listen to me carefully, then. I hate repeating myself. I am Professor Swift. We have three rules here. Don't touch anything, always return the tools, and don't distract me unless you find something. Sounds simple enough. Are you the only one in charge here, Mr. Swift? Yes, I am the only one, and no one else. You hear anything other than that, it's a lie. People of your kind can have difficulty understanding who's in charge. Take a minute, memorize my face, and then get to work. Oh, I will definitely take a closer look to memorize my superior. I wish I could be as passionate about something as you are, Mr. Swift. You value knowledge and dedication over everything else. It's a long road, young man. A sharp eye and attention to detail are the only stepping stones along this path. You have to sacrifice everything you love for the larger prize. Exactly. So much in life is uh, superficial. I wish more people would understand. I never heard a truer word, lad. Folk will ignore what truly matters in life, and for what? Convenience. Bold words indeed. I doubt that many scientists would be willing to support their bragging with fieldwork. The academic world is full of restrictions. Our honorable professors are too afraid to dirty their hands. God forbid if they have a stain on their shirt. You can follow in my footsteps. You can start learning by returning to work. Show me what you can find. It seems everything's in place. Now, let's see what this has to tell us. your discovery, Mr. Swift. Hey, look at this. What have you found? Don't let anyone touch anything there. Eureka! I found you, my friend. Trying to take over my research, are you? I come here to pick up my diary, and I find you snooping around. Explain yourself. Mr. Swift, if that were true, I would have been on my way to the newspaper. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I didn't have a chance to introduce myself properly. Outrageous! You deceived me, sir! What is the reason for your being here? Who sent you, Mr. Holmes? Theodore Gildon's premature death brought me here. Theodore? Is dead? How can that be possible? I'm thinking of all the possibilities, and I'm not crossing out anyone who might have been involved. Even his elephant. The land you're excavating belongs to Mr. Gildon, does it not? Did I hear an accusation? I have nothing to hide. You can ask me whatever nonsense you've prepared as a token of my diminishing respect towards you. Very well, Mr. Swift. I appreciate your cooperation. When was the last time you saw Mr. Gildon? A couple of days ago. We discussed the site. I believe in the tomb and its secrets. 
Theodore's patience was stretched, however. He was already inventing new projects. It wasn't a long conversation. I suppose that his daughter will inherit everything now, along with all of the eccentricities and problems. And not forgetting Goliath. Eccentricities and problems, Mr. Holmes. One of many. Were you at the site this morning? Affirmative. This project is taking a lot of my time, as you see. I spend more time underground than on the surface. When did you learn about Theodore's death? Just now. You just told me. And you aren't surprised? Shocked? I won't tell anyone if you shed a tear or two. Weren't you partners, after all? We were. And it is a real shame. But I've seen too many deaths in my life, Mr. Holmes, for the news to truly shake me. Will you allow me to return to my research, or are you insisting on remaining an obstacle? Oh, I haven't even started yet. You have a weakness for nostalgia? Or, rather, do you use it to record a list of enemies? Young man, you need to check your moral compass. Reading another person's diary is a sin in every culture that I can think of. But you aren't answering the question. You've already read it. Why bother? I simply record my life to keep my memory clean from misinterpretation. Letters and pages don't lie. But the writer of the text can. With this book, you were tempted to plan an attack on the elephant? Your insinuations are out of place. Goliath is a frightening animal. All I wished to do was to understand the creature. As any scientist would do, I researched, analyzed, and drew conclusions. Hmm. And what conclusion did you draw? That Theodore Gilden made the animal miserable. He couldn't provide the proper environment for the beast. My interest in the subject ended there. What's with this box of darts? Is it for a scientific argument? A little darker than that. Rather, for killing the kind of rodents that might nibble a nose or a toe in your sleep. Let's just say I have to protect myself against a larger animal, such as an elephant. Might it be enough to stop it, make it faint? If I were you, I wouldn't bank on it. I've nothing to add. I'm a busy man. As far as I can tell, you're a man of the academic world, so this book about Nabe and Laura is just an empirical study? What? That nonsense? I'd prefer to lose my eyesight than read such trash. So, you know nothing about it? I know nothing. I wish I'd never heard of it in the first place, this caricature of science. Do I hear traces of envy? You're still relatively young that you might find your own Laura. Perhaps I envy Nabe, for I cannot simply blow people up for distracting me. That's all. You happy now? Wonderful. I've nothing to add. What's with this intricate recruitment process? Pro-British workers charge less? As a head of this organization, I need to secure a productive environment. It's impossible to do so if there are political differences. Especially here, where the native population doesn't support our efforts to find the ancient artifacts. Decent pay can also stimulate productivity and shut down any political discord. Hadn't you thought of that? You're young. You have time to fritter and fight with everyone you meet. I don't have such a luxury. Our workers receive enough pay for what they do. So don't start a discussion you know nothing about. I'm a busy man. Moving on. I've nothing to add. I've nothing to add. Moving on. Your partner had a very specific attitude towards the things he treasured. Was this habitual for him? That would have been too much even for him. Don't get me wrong, he had a harsh temper. Like a true businessman, he was ready to burn his competitors to the ground. But threatening someone physically would have been something new even for him, am I correct? Absolutely. Besides, I had never seen him this angry. The fellow who received the letter must have been extremely alarmed. Have you seen this person before? The one beside Imogen Gildon? No, but he's with Imogen, so I suppose that he's a friend of hers. 
That girl always has her head in the clouds. I could have said Theodore was different, but that wouldn't have been entirely true. Away with the fairies, was he? That's one way of putting it. Either way, I don't know much about Imogen's life or her friends. The type of elite that pretends to be educated. Moving on. Gildan's Elephant is quite an unusual addition to Cordona's fauna. What is your scientific opinion on that? No matter how much Theodore loved it, it still remained a wild animal trapped inside a stone pen. Goliath needs savannas, fields, lakes. I'm sure that Goliath did not have a plan to kill his owner to head to the savannas. What do you think? No. Animals don't kill in a typical sense. I can only presume that it tried to protect itself from captivity, from Theodore. It was a gilded cage that was predestined to break. Did this plan cause a rift in your business relationship with Theodore Gilden? Nothing like that. Admittedly, we didn't share a common vision of what is more important, the past or the future, in my opinion. We can't build a future without knowing the past. So you wanted to save the tomb of Vitus here, or perhaps your control over the research? Only the knowledge that rightly belongs to humankind. Nothing less and nothing more. Remember one of the rules? It uh, seems that you didn't return a tool. Is this knife yours? Do I look like a fellow who carries a knife? I don't need it. There are plenty of uses for it on the site, and outside of it. I have other people to cut ropes for me, Mr. Holmes. May I ask you something? I like you, friend, but I can't help you.
Have you seen what your father sent to Paul? This is despicable. My father was never a gentleman, but this crosses the line. I knew that father wasn't fond of Paul, but this... This is just awful. If only he could have seen how good Paul he is to me. I'm afraid I can't add anything useful. I have nothing to say about this. I don't have any thoughts on this. I'm afraid I can't add anything useful. Are you aware that Paul smuggles drugs for a dangerous gang? Mr. Holmes, I've already told you. I call him a pirate in play. He's not an actual pirate. He's a champion and a brave gentleman, not a thug. Let us agree to disagree on that. But don't be surprised if one of his clients knocks on your door. Who's a cute bird? Who's a cute bird? It's chilling to think the monster is free. Your fellow mariners have a strange way of showing hospitality. They were not my friends. Are you sure? I would rather risk my neck for someone who's at least honest and thankful. Perhaps then don't enter someone's life and be so judgmental, pretending you're better than they are. Then give me your perspective and allow me to see through your eyes. What were you doing this morning, Miss Perks? Don't call me that. I'm a champion. I was sailing. The other club members told me that you missed the race this morning. Do champions not need to practice? Ugh, you've talked with them already. No, I wasn't racing. I visited the doctor after that attack on me. And then I had to honor the deal with the bandits you just took care of. I tried to tell you before, but your partners interrupted. Have you heard the news? Theodore Gilden is dead. Do you have anything to say? Well, what a shock. To me, he was an angry old ogre. Good riddance. Was it Goliath that killed him? Did it crush him? Break his bones? Come on, tell me. I want all the details. You have an unusual way of showing grief. Imogen wouldn't appreciate that. But yes, the animal could have been involved. It's poetic in a way, isn't it? It takes a beast to kill a monster. I wish I could have been that elephant. You're asking for trouble with this smuggling business. You'd better leave it before they smuggle you out in a barrel. Don't patronize me. I've only ever had trouble with law-abiding citizens like Gildan and you. Never bandits. So ask me anything you want, and then get out of my sight. I have to leave you for a moment. Don't sail too far away. You smuggle illicit psychotropes on your yacht. Not a delivery for the hospital, I'm sure. Of course not. I've had to cut corners to earn some money. How might a person afford to pay for a yacht in an honest way? I don't know, although I'm smart. The buyers are my customers. Adults who are willing to pay for their pleasure, or weapons for jewels. Whatever they want me to deliver. Nothing criminal. Well, it's your lucky day. I'm not here because of smuggling. Have you tasted this tea yourself? I wouldn't have been a champion if I had used it. It's just a side business that keeps my career afloat. It's quite expensive to compete in yachting. Sometimes I cut corners. Such as fixing whirlpool yourself? Exactly. 
And sometimes I just have to pay. That's how I earn money. I don't sell slaves or take the last mangir from a poor family. It seems as though Theodore Gilden hung a sword of Damocles over your life and career. Were these only words or something more serious? Pfft. Check my forearm. Pulled muscles and bruises. Small cuts. Nothing that you could call serious. I doubt that a man in his late fifties could wrestle you. It wasn't him. He behaved like a rat and hired brutes. His boys tried to lock my hands behind my back, but I was faster and I escaped. Was he so protective of his daughter, or was it your feminine secret that provoked him? My guess is that he was protecting his property. As he saw it, he owned Imogen, and he treated her like a piece of furniture. He didn't want his daughter to be loved by anyone. What's more painful is that Theodore didn't allow me to love his daughter. Typical. I'm not sure that your relationship with Imogen could be described as typical. Are you afraid of a woman in trousers? Now that's typical of men. Does this knife seem familiar? I didn't find it in your competitor's back, to be clear. This knife is as blunt as your humor. It's a boson's knife, but it's not mine. I wouldn't be so careless as to mislay my tools. A. Swift, are you familiar with this name? The gentleman had business with Mr. Gildon. Likely just another strange and wrinkled fellow like old Gildon was. Perhaps this swift person has a rhino, and they wanted to see which pet was stronger. In other words, I don't know who he is, but I bet he's crazy like Theodore. I doubt that court owner has ever boasted a battle arena for that size of mammal. You have an interesting imagination. What can you tell me about the elephant? He's smarter than some people here, including his owner. Although I feel he could be dangerous, no matter how much he's fed. Why is that? Have you ever seen Goliath attack anyone? Well, not exactly. But I saw it, uh, abusing some poor tree during one of its walks with Theodore. The expression on that old ninny's face was priceless. But it wasn't funny to look at. Believe me, it was frightening. Between yachts, darts, and notes from bandits, I've discovered many fascinating facts about you. But this, an installment of Nabe and Laura's adventures, why did you sully your library with this? It's a gift from Imogen. I didn't buy it. I might have turned a couple of pages, but nothing more. I swear. I will give you the benefit of the doubt, but your literary taste has put you on my blacklist. A charming picture. I've heard that champions do often pose with their trophies. Cheeky. It is a lovely trophy, though. I'm sure you will agree. What is it that you like most about her? Her naivety? Her father's money? A somewhat difficult choice. Especially now that her father is out of the equation. Look what I found. A box full of darts. Hey, that's mine. I confiscated it. These darts appear to be filled with something. Poison? How powerful is it? It's strychnine. Enough to instantly kill a small rodent. I haven't tried it on a human. Yet. I hope you know what you're doing. Could it immobilize a larger animal? Say, an elephant? I've never tried. But I have wondered. Imogen doesn't strike me as an industrious young lady, so I find it strange that she was busy packing up all her belongings when Mr. Gildon died. That's some um, favorable wind in your sails, isn't it? Is it so suspicious that a couple might embark on a trip? I wanted to thank her, so we planned to go traveling. A Theodore-free place, without elephants. The timing of it is suspicious, however. Your lady friend becomes an orphan and heir, and there's a planned trip directly afterwards. An improvised romantic dinner will never please a spoiled girl. A planned voyage might. It's not spur of the moment. Good day, madam. I've come to you with a special requirement. The tailors on the street can't help me, I'm afraid. Could you make a doll for me? Oh, Senior Holmes. You taught the police how to do their job, and they found the thief. Of course I will help you. But what sort of doll? A child's doll, such as my great niece might play with? Um, a little larger than your typical doll. Signore, I don't understand. Boy, girl, animal, and what color? Animal, um, a passionate, perhaps amorous animal. Ah, oh, Signore, you talk in riddles. I am an old lady who's seen it all. Tell me what you need. 
I need a life-size elephant. I think Mrs. Nini outdid herself with this one. Is that a tail? That's a trunk, John, but I must agree with you that it's a masterpiece. Well, let's not waste any time. The game is on. So, what's the plan? I hope it all doesn't go horribly wrong. We know that the elephant is seeking a female. We can arrange that. A doll with the appropriate scent might do miracles. So you're a marriage broker? Well, I suppose that makes me a groomsman. Oh, she is a bit breezy, I must say. Well, Goliath is eager for a single female elephant in his area. It should be just enough for his taste. You'll need to trust me. Are we ready? I can't stand the tension. We're ready. Let's call the elephant. That deserves a slap. And then a kiss. And here's our lovesick friend. Is the meaning of this? Why are you bringing it here? I won't allow you to leave it. I assure you that it is only a temporary measure. It won't be long until the elephant is gone, I promise you. It injured itself while running through the forest. Peaceful and compliant, almost a gentleman. The left tusk is larger and more worn. You're a left tusk elephant. There's something in the needle. A feathered fletching. This might be promising. You are guilty, Mr. Swift. Killing Theodore Gildon was a testing challenge. You succeeded. What makes you think I'm somehow involved in Gildon's death? My partner's death, I might remind you. You were there when Theodore Gildon died. Nonsense. I visited him many times, but I wasn't there when the elephant killed him. Then I must have made a mistake because the murderer met Goliath's rage personally. The perpetrator was hit by the gate and thrown into the shed. Your bruise matches the contour of the broken hole. One further detail is that the murderer had a bosun's knife. Fairly useful in a place where one might cut ropes and fabric, such as, I don't know, the dig site? That's your interpretation of the facts, Mr. Holmes. You've simply aligned them to suit your hypothesis. It's not a hypothesis once proven, it's theory, Mr. Swift. Your dart uses strychnine to kill rodents at the site, is that correct? Well, yes, that is its purpose. The same dart with strychnine was found on Goliath. The very same substance is a powerful stimulant. It causes convulsions, a flow of energy. You shot Goliath. The elephant became extremely energetic, agitated, and so terrified that it killed its owner. For a man of your age, it was easier to hit a larger grey target than a small man. You said it yourself. Goliath killed Theodore, and your strychnine speculations are absurd. Only athletes use it as a stimulant, not elephants. True, but one dart of strychnine would not be enough to kill the elephant, and you knew it. Let me tell you a story. A man spends almost five years of his life locating an artifact. He puts every ounce of energy and money into his research. The same man even goes so far as to sign a contract with a ruthless man, a businessman. It was a risk, but the reward would be worth it. Years go by and there's still no result, so the businessman decides to end the man's research. He spits on the research, he promises to bury the site under an eccentric project, all of this is just his whim. 
Theodore Gildon could do anything he wanted with this place, and you were anxious about the fate of your research. You wished to protect it. You tried to tame Gildon's eccentricity, but you killed him instead. Theodore wasn't trying to sabotage my career. We had a disagreement, but it wasn't as dire as you describe it. He wasn't a pleasure to talk to, but killing him? Nonsense. Theodore Gildon was a capricious man, extremely impulsive. But the cold-blooded nature of your plan makes you even more dangerous. You feel nothing. You show no remorse. It was simply a calculated move. And that is why you are under arrest. Nothing. You have nothing on me. I think I'll let the police decide if my findings are substantial enough for prosecution. This is all a dreadful mistake. This can't be happening. The elephant killed Theodore. Goliath is innocent and he should be free. He is not the real murderer here. That is the apex of your career, Mr. Swift. Farewell. I told you Mr. Swift was not a real archaeologist. He was a murderer. I knew there was something wrong with him. Fortunately for us, being a murderer was not his profession. And about the elephant? While you were busy, I've dealt with it. No thanks to you. I asked you to solve this wretched problem, but you didn't. I couldn't be in two places at once, Miss Gildon. I was catching your father's murderer. But how have you dealt with it? A man agreed to take the elephant away. He came to me asking for permission to relocate it to his property, and I accepted. Well, congratulations, I suppose. That is one less problem. Actually, two, Mr. Holmes. I found my father's possessions that you can take with you and disappear. I appreciate it, truly. Well, someone has to do something. Take everything if you need to and leave me be... Take care of yourself, Miss Gildon. My mother always wore this around her neck until one day it disappeared. I was wondering where it went. She said it was a birthday present from a good friend. I just had another glimpse of a memory, John. It's fuzzy, but I'm sure it happens somewhere in the manor. You know, I envy you, Sherry. You can talk to other people and they won't ignore you. And I envy you. You can ignore any person you're bored with. You don't miss out on much. Most men are dull, unlike yourself. Well, I'm flattered. I had a surprise for my mother. You had a shovel with you, John. I was holding an ancient Greek vase, or rather, quite a big piece of it. I remember now, we dug up the vase from Greek ruins here on Cordona and were eager to show my mother right away. For some reason, the door was closed. We knocked. But nobody answered. We thought that she was busy. So we left the vase and ran downstairs. I decided to gather some archaeological tools in order to take a closer look at the vase. But then we heard something, didn't we? Yes. It came from upstairs. The vase was broken, shards scattered all over the floor, and your mother was standing at the door. Indeed, John. I doubt it was her. Let me concentrate. Otto Richter was standing there, furious at us. Dr. Richter told us never to disturb my mother when the door is closed. He said she had broken the vase. But we didn't believe him. I bet he smashed it. Her things are still here. Presumably Mycroft never felt the need to sort through it all. Or couldn't bring himself to. No. He would have put it behind him and moved on. My brother is not one for sentimentality.
You're not obliged to be here, Sherry. We can leave any time you want. This picture was drawn by my mother. I recognize her hand. There's a date on it, 8th of December, 1868. This seems a bit odd. I can recognize my mother's style, but it's far too sloppy. Dated 12th of February, 1869. It's difficult to tell what this is meant to represent. There's no date at all. Straps on the bed. It just doesn't look right. Seems this was the most frequently used medication. Oh, I would love to take a bath right now. Not this one. Surface corrosion suggests it was prone to extreme temperature fluctuations. For medical purposes, I suppose. Do you think the doctor could have used these tools here? I hope not. There appear to be residues of the bottle's contents at the bottom. It's a strange feeling to read about my father's death in the newspaper. I can't recall anything except the deep feeling of loss. You were too young. It happened before we even met. It's so sad. I'm sorry. This room always reeked with an acrid medicinal stench. And here is the reason. My mother loved flowers. They made her smile. I remember we Look what I found. Okay, every the White King is under attack. That's why we collected all the violet flowers we could find on the island. Oh, nice move. You saved the king and checkmated the Black King with the Rook. I don't believe you, liars. Get away from me. It's not true. It's not real. What? Oh. Everything will be okay, Sherry. I promise. It was the morning of the 9th of April, the day my mother died. My mother, she, she was not just ill, but bad. God have mercy. I'm sorry. That explains why you locked the memory away. There must be more, John. I, that was the morning of her death. I need to know what happened. Every time you... I, I just don't... Please, Sherry, leave it be. Just breathe, John. You know that I cannot leave the last stone unturned. We are so close. I... I know. But can we at least leave it for another day? Well, history tells us these memories are triggered by our investigation of other matters. I suspect it could not be forced even if I so desired. Thank you. How are you feeling about all this? Tell me, I'm not the only one reeling. In the end, little has changed. My mother was still unwell, just not with tuberculosis. What I do not yet understand is why Mycroft lied about it. There are precious few pieces of this puzzle remaining, John. Let us dawdle here no longer. Indeed. Wait. Did you hear that? Yes. Metallic souls. What is this sailor doing here? With whom do I have the pleasure of speaking? You could call me your new game. The rules are simple. I have something for you, but you alone must work out what that is. And that something is my prize, I suppose? You're a fast learner, sir. I cannot believe that Mr. Vogel has somehow successfully called my attention to his gallery. You're here with an invitation to visit it, obviously. My word, you are fast, Mr. Holmes. Could you explain how you came to that conclusion? Of course. Explanations are my favorite part of any conversation. Hands without any sign of regular physical activity in contradiction to one who would most usually wear such a uniform. The paint in your hair is pink. I don't know of any military service that paints their ships pink unless they have launched a new fashionable fleet. A sailor with the soul of an artist? I would suggest rather a gallery employee disguised as a sailor to mislead me. How many artists on the island know where I live and of my passion for deduction? Werner Vogel is clearly at the top of the list. And you've been attempting to conceal something square-shaped within your pocket. 
An invitation, I suppose. An invitation to Mr. Vogel's gallery. That was remarkable, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Vogel was right about your genius. I think he may have even underestimated you. This is your invitation. Please tell Mr. Vogel that the seed has been planted. He asked me to tell you to do so, if you win this little game. Farewell. Mr. Holmes, you came. Oh, how kind. Though now, of course, I realize it is because of my game, not the works on display. It needn't be one or the other. Your man's disguise was easily debunked, Mr. Vogel, but I shall admit that you planted in me the seed of curiosity. Ah, terrific! I had no doubt you'd put the pieces together. Let us call it an opening gambit before the real game begins. So, this little game of yours, what's it about? An enigma to solve. A locked area in the basement with no windows found brutally vandalized. I have no clue how it was possible. And this locked area downstairs, what exactly was it? The under gallery. It's always shut, and I'm the only one with the key. Ah, so this is your private collection, not part of the gallery. Oh, no! It's an exclusive exhibition of eccentric pieces. Only a select cadre of artists, investors and collectors are admitted. Not everyone deserves to have their eyes opened. What about this intrusion? What happened? Last night, I was about to leave the gallery when I heard a noise downstairs. I went to the basement, but I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. It was admittedly a rudimentary inspection. It is not uncommon to get rats down there, so seeing nothing of note, I left and locked up the building. When I returned this morning, alas, I discovered that part of the exhibition had been torched, and there was no sign of the intruder. The mystery being, of course, that all the doors to the gallery were locked exactly as I left them. And the door to the basement is the only entrance? Correct. Tell me you're not intrigued. Well, this matter is certainly within my wheelhouse. This intrusion troubles me. Please take a look around if you're willing. The under gallery is through the door at the end. I will see what I see. Back home, we've got a taxidermist. He's going to have a heart attack when he sees what I bring him. A simplistic attempt at provocation. The left step's length is shorter than the right. It indicates that the walker was lame. A handprint of the thing from another world. But it looks fresh and its coal origin ruins the effect of the extra mundane. Sherry? How about some company in that dreary chamber of yours? Leave my loneliness unbroken, John. Sodden and mould-ridden. One presumes deliberately. Ugh, sheer vandalism. Only an ignorant person could do such a thing. Cold fingerprints. I think we're looking for a man with a cold moustache. The parasites of creativity. Or just a reflection of the artist's recreational interests. Saturn devouring his son. A grim composition. Unflinching in its ferocity, yet somehow beautiful. The intruder entered the basement through the coal chute. He used a magnet to open the hatch bolt. He accidentally pushed a shovel to the floor. Vogel heard the noise. At the sound of his approaching footsteps, the intruder hid inside the coffin. When Vogel entered the basement, he failed to notice anything strange and left without properly checking. The intruder waited until Vogel had left the caravanserai before burning the paintings in Wilde's room. But the vandalism was a cover for the theft. The pieces are not what I expected. What do you think my collection is about? Extravagant paintings have been left to rot in a basement. A commentary on decay and the crumbling of society, correct? I don't know. Well, that's absurd. Of course you know. It's your gallery. There is no one answer, no singular truth, but many filtered through the subjective mind. That forgetting, embellishing, lying machine. Besides, what's wrong with a lie if it makes life more interesting? What's wrong with a lie? It corrupts the ability of others to behave freely and rationally. 
Men never act freely and rationally anyway. It matters not what is or isn't in the end. The only important thing is how you feel. And I simply want to feel and consume as much as I can. Don't you? Feelings are simply one's animal ancestry trying to wrest back control of the brain. I try to avoid the distraction. You try not to feel, even in a place like this? None of it moves you? To be frank, I struggle to maintain even a wit of interest in art. But, Mr. Holmes, it is joy incarnate, mankind's greatest achievement. Mankind's highest achievement above all others is objective and rational thought. I see, then, why you dislike art, for it means whatever you wanted to. Or, perhaps, Mr. Vogel, I was lying. Aha. Uh -huh. Mr. Vogel, my investigation has revealed that the intrusion was not merely vandalism, but theft. The limping visitor left your place with a canvas. That's very impressive. The fire was a clever attempt to hide a stolen painting, even if it didn't fool me. I found the remnants of an empty frame in the pile of ashes. The canvas had been removed. Do you know which paintings in the Wild Room may have interested a thief? Were any particularly expensive? Those pieces belonged to a well-known artist named Boniface Mercurio. They're controversial, but not of a notably high value. The intruder entered the basement through the coal chute. He used a magnet to open the latch and dislodged the shovel while doing so. That's the noise you heard yesterday. When you went downstairs to investigate, he hid in the coffin. Hmm. It seems I should have checked the space more thoroughly. This thief was familiar with the gallery and he was sporting a limp. Do any of your clients or artists come to mind? My. Your attention to detail is remarkable, Mr. Holmes. I should introduce you to Bosch's works. Alas, I'm afraid I cannot suggest a culprit. There's something more, is there not? I can see it in your eyes. Hmm, indeed. There is another intriguing angle. I recently received an anonymous offer for one of Mercurio's works. The sum was more than fair, and indeed could have saved Mercurio from his artistic poverty. But he declined it. Was it a performative whim? Some artists lionize pain and hardship as if their work would be worse after a meal and a hot bath. I cannot tell. But not only did he refuse the deal, he insisted on displaying the painting in the public space. I was hoping to change his mind, but artists are a special breed of stubborn. So where can I find Boniface Mercurio? I know he lives somewhere in Old City, but couldn't be more specific. He's a prominent figure, so finding him shouldn't be a problem. What was depicted in the piece? Hmm, a bound woman, wrapped in robes, being penetrated by a red devil that stared at us, the viewer. The beast had numerous tails growing from his back, and a large crowd gathered around the pair, silently watching the orgiastic scene. Okay, well, given the nature of the other works on display, it's hard to see why that one stood out. What could possibly be its value? The evaluation of art is very subjective, Mr. Holmes. After all, art is everything. A poem, a bruise, the beads of sweat on your beloved skin. Even a masterfully solved crime. I'm not sure I see the connection. Regardless, the painting was one of a series called The Sabbath Night in Cordona. The works depict sex, violence, and other controversial acts that life, for better or worse, contains. Ah, I see. I'm not sure that you do, but that can wait for another time. Well, I believe I have enough to begin. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. Your gallery certainly has unexpected depths. I'm delighted to have been able to please a friend. In return, I expect you to come back with good news. Or at least with a good story.
Can I ask you a question? You have a job, so why don't you go back to it instead of bothering me? Excuse me, just one question. Excuse my ignorance, but I have no idea. Could you help me? I'd help you if I knew. Oh, I am bored. Call me when you find the answer. Excuse me, just one question. I cannot, sorry. Do you know anything about this? Go back to work. I'm not answering your questions. Everyone's looking at us, Sheriff. You should know what you're doing. Excuse me, young man. Where do you think you're going? Greetings, ma'am. I'm looking for the... I don't care who you're looking for. You shall not pass. No visitors allowed. I wish to buy a painting from Mr. Boniface Mercurio. Is he at... Dearie, tell me because old age has made me blind. Did someone write information bureau on my forehead? Because I'm not here to answer your questions. Entry is for residents only. If you aren't a resident, please leave. Or I shall report you to the police. Ah... Old age does terrible things to one's sight. I didn't recognize you at first. How are you, Mum? I I'm ashamed to admit that I've lost my key. Do you have a spare? For heaven's sake! How many times will you lose that key of yours? Of course I have a spare. You artists all live in your own little world. Please, accept my thanks. I would rather accept your rent. You promised to pay me several weeks ago and I'm still waiting. I will pay you, I promise, very soon. You'd better do, my dear. Or else I'll just change the lock. And I won't fall for those cow eyes. Red skin, tails on the back, reminds me of Verda's description of the stolen painting. Don't look at me like that, Sherry. I will not touch that dirty floor. The blood has dried. I've heard of this style of painting. It is called Expressionism. Look at this, John. Isn't it our stolen demon? Mercurio heard him coming. While the thief was searching the chest, the painter ran towards him with a bottle in his hand. He smashed it across the thief's head. The intruder had no choice but to defend himself, and the weapon of opportunity happened to be a kitchen knife. Mercurio stepped aside to grab the painting, but the wine-blinded thief attacked Mercurio's throat. When the thief came to his senses, he saw Mercurio bleeding on the floor. He grabbed the rags and tried to bandage him, but it was too late. Why did Mercurio attempt to snatch the painting in the middle of a fight? To strike the intruder? Not with his painting, it was too important to him. I guess this is his most ordinary painting. Spot the two differences, John. If the intruder didn't take it, the skull should be somewhere here. monster was actually a man. Poor girl. John, you ought to be thrilled. We are now hunting the devil himself. Uh, what were you saying, Sherry? I was too busy sketching the scene, you know, crimes and such like, daily routine. Did you find something? A photograph. It depicts a man in a red suit with tails sprouting from his back and multiple people in masks watching the scene. It all adds up. But the act of love, it wasn't given willingly, John. It was a violation. And the girl, she was with child. Give that to me now. Did you recognize someone? No. Although the victim is not from Cordona, she is African. Look at the ritual scars on her face. Get that image out of your brain. You have to continue the investigation. I must speak to the landlady. Perhaps she saw or heard something. Sherry, you cannot tell her the truth about Mercurio. It will hurt her. John, that's illogical. Sooner or later, she will come here and discover a corpse, and I still need to talk to her. Just avoid mentioning corpse. All right? Stick to the character. Tell her to call the police. 
I'll take that into account. And wait here. I've redrawn the people in the photograph. Now you can proceed with your investigation without those horrific details. What's wrong, dear? You look like you've seen the ghost. Can you tell me if anyone else has recently entered the flat? Oh, you're talking about that limping man. I'm sorry I let him in. I was scared. And I thought maybe... Maybe he would motivate you to find money so that you would pay your rent. No offence, dear. Can you describe him? Oh, so you weren't at home. I was so certain you didn't leave your flat that day. He was of average height, had a limp and a tattoo on his neck, and he was smoking Malpal cigarettes. My husband used to smoke those. They have a horrible smell I can recognise from a mile away. Can I ask a favour? Of course, dearie. Please call the police and ask them to enter the flat, and don't look inside until they come up. What? What trouble have you stepped in this time? It really doesn't matter. Thank you, Mum. Oh, Sherry, that was close. But you did everything correctly. Now, take off your outfit. I can't let you walk around in a dead man's clothes. Sir, this place is off limits to the public. Please state your business or leave, or I shall request that the police escort you out. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm a private investigator. I'm looking for a witness for a case. A private investigator? Really? Even so, you're not authorised. I can't let you in. And you are? I'm Ronald Harlow, here to handle the refugee situation on behalf of City Hall. I'm the acting supervisor here, so I have full authority here to ask you to leave or I shall order the police to detain you for trying to pass the blockade. Please, step back. The people in the crowd are shouting about a murder in the camp. Are you trying to hide it? It's mere assumption. I assure you that the situation is under the police's control. If it was under control, if there was no dead body, you wouldn't be as nervous as you are. You would be sitting in your cosy dark corner of the City Hall room doing nothing as usual. Yet, you're here, trying to deal with a series of problems you never asked for. These insults are inappropriate. You don't know what I'm doing for this camp. Even though the rest of City Hall doesn't give a bloody squat about the refugees, maybe I didn't want to be assigned to this camp. But I'm trying to do my best for these people. If not for my work, they might not have any shelter or food even. I apologise, Mr Harlow. Perhaps I was prejudiced towards you, but in any case, I'm sure that you would still want this to be over as quickly as possible. The current reality is that neither you nor the police are managing things well here. You are unable to calm the crowd. You have simply never handled a situation like this before. What are you driving at, Mr. Holmes? I can help you to handle the situation if you're truly interested in solving things quickly and quietly. And how exactly would you manage that? Simply tell the police that I'm with City Hall and I'm permitted to investigate the scene. I'll work out the rest, but in return I need your help finding my witness. She's a young refugee. She's with child or was with child recently. Look, there is indeed a dead body inside the camp. So even if the girl you are looking for is there, all the refugees are now being detained and interrogated by the police. They won't allow you to speak with her, and I can't do anything about that until the situation settles down. So it's in our mutual interest to settle it. Oh. I suppose that things are bad enough that I ought not shy away from help. All right, Mr. Holmes. I'll tell the police to allow you to come inside. Just tell me when you're ready. I'm ready to take a look at the scene. All right. Go inside the camp and find Inspector Tewksbury. He's the officer investigating the scene. Tell him I sent you. Say you're an independent expert from City Hall. He'll fill in the details for you. I'll find my way with words. Thank you, Mr. Harlow. So they keep these refugees under a bridge like proverbial troll. Who the hell are you? How did you get in here? Mr. Ronald Harlow, let me in, sir. I'm Sherlock Holmes, a surveyor of refugee affairs with City Hall. You're Inspector Tewksbury, I presume? A surveyor? What does that even mean? In short, I've been sent to conduct an extensive report on the incident for the Colonial Office and to assess all the damage inflicted on state property. Got it. Another paperworm sent to count money and get food for archive mould. 
Go on, look around, but don't make yourself too at home. As if I didn't have enough problems before you appeared. Could you first tell me what happened here? What happened? People from the bridge above the camp heard a woman screaming and saw a mass of refugees attacking a man. Clearly not a refugee. When the camp guards came by, the man was floating in the sewage canal with a knife in his chest. Bam. A murder. Big news for Cordona. I'm sure. Thank you, Inspector. Did you learn anything about the dead man? The fellow looks like a thug. I've had dozens like him fished out of the sea over the past 20 years. Ever since these refugees arrived, there have been people on Cordona with bad blood in them. My best bet is that this thug had something against them too. And no clue as to his identity? He had some items on his body, but nothing to indicate who he was or where he was from. I think I should catalogue his possessions in my records. Go on. They're on the table near the body. And none of the refugees were harmed? One fellow was cut. He's lying over there near their... kitchen. He's in a bad way. You mentioned a woman screaming who attracted the bypassers on the bridge. Was she harmed? No, she's all right, but perhaps the whole debacle started because of her. She started wailing and the refugees stood up for the girl. And where is this young woman now? Back there in the shacks, same as the rest of the refugees. She's been questioned by my men, but she's just some refugee girl. Can't understand much English. Do you have any suspects yet? You're joking, right? I've got a whole camp full of suspects. And if you ask me, this bloke had it coming. Better bury him and forget about the whole thing. And now there's a crowd gathered at the camp, and my superiors say we must thoroughly interrogate the refugees. At least those who can understand any English. Do you believe that your superiors wish to get rid of the refugees? I think that both our superiors would rather keep the story quiet. Since that's an unaffordable luxury now, they're looking how to protect their public image. That's why I have to waste my time waiting for my people to turn every stone and befriend every refugee. Zero. Clearly a left handprint here. A furrow in the ground. A blood trail leading to or from the canal. Someone bled profusely here. A fresh crack, as if the crate was hit recently. A man's footprint. A heavy boot with a worn-out sole. <sighs> Police boots. Always happy to trample evidence. Well, carnelian agate beads, a traditional African adornment. The blood sprayed off the blade after the strike. It might have been used as an improvised weapon. The cut is deep, potentially serious if not treated immediately. He is in shock, feverish and dehydrated. Sherry, you know first aid. Surely you have a duty to help this man. You can't leave him to certain death. Someone was dragged against their will. Just washed. Better than nothing to bandage the wound. Sherry, just look at this. Living quarters in a sewer. What kind of a genius bureaucrat came up with this idea? If they find out about the... Nobody will know anything if you keep your bloody mouth shut. The coppers smell fishy here, Sherry. Perhaps we should sniff around in the camp a little more thoroughly. I'd say the blade penetrated upward, however the wound is too messy to be certain. A violent death. This man, limping. Cold us. I think we're onto something here, John. One thousand pounds. A fair sum, especially considering British currency isn't very comp. A simple leather sheath. Perfect for a dirk. You know what? I'd like to understand. What? How did our dead man end up inside the camp in the first place? Ah, uh, thank you. This should make you feel better, my friend. Now remain lying down and drink as much water as you can. Well done, Sherry. At least he won't die from the infection. So, we have a thug who came to take a refugee woman with him. She resisted, but he dragged her by force. One of the refugees stood in his way, armed with a stick, yet he could do nothing against a cutthroat with a blade. The man didn't anticipate that the other refugees would intervene and stand against him. In the confusion, the woman managed to break free. The thug took fright and fled. He was stopped by the falling crates. He stumbled and fell, piercing his chest with his own blade. 
However, the wound didn't cause instant death. He managed to stand, but still bleeding, he lost his balance on the bridge and fell. Before all of this, the man had freely entered the camp through the main entrance. The police admitted him after they had a short smoke together. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. In our man's case, it's the same sword. You still here? Inspector, I believe I can aid your investigation. I know who the dead man is and what really happened here. You do? Well, good for you. But I'm afraid I'm not the one you need to share your findings with. Speak to Mr. Harlow here. He's the one responsible for settling things in the camp. You don't even care to listen? Oh, I do care. Maybe even more than I need to. But I'm only here today to lock the place up, question witnesses, and file the facts. It's sad, but coming up with conclusions is not among my tasks here. You fellows at City Hall do that. Anyway, speak to the supervisor. I'll just stand by and listen to what you have to say. I'll just look around and do my paperwork. You won't even notice me. I wish. Mr. Harlow, your refugees didn't murder anyone. What? Pray tell me what you've learned. All right, listen carefully. This might solve one problem for you, but will create a few more. Oh, well, that's a great start. The man came to the camp intending to kidnap one of your refugees, a woman. What he didn't expect was that the refugees would stand up to protect the woman. A brawl had broken out. In the chaos of it, the man stumbled over those crates and fell on his own blade. How do you know he fell on his own blade? The wound in his chest was inflicted from an unusual angle. It was not an offensive stab, shall we say. The refugees didn't touch him. And judging by the blood at the scene, the intruder managed to raise himself but was unable to walk very far. He ultimately fell into the canal. But how did he sneak into the camp? Why didn't the police see him? And this is where your new problems emerge, Mr. Harlow. What do you mean? You're not a dull-witted man. You know what I mean. There is no feasible way to get into the camp without the police guards knowing of it. <sighs> the pile of mess I had to sort out has just become bigger. But somehow that doesn't surprise me. Anyway, I thank you for your help, Mr. Holmes. I'll take it from here. Meanwhile, I'll make sure the police aren't detaining the refugees any longer. You can go back in and look for your witness. You think one small clock can make any difference in this place? Who knows, John? Just one ill-fitting cog could make the whole machine crumble. You're the one who tended to our man's wounds. I thank you greatly. The police didn't allow us to help him. The police will leave you alone now. I've proven to them that the man who came into the camp died due to his own foolishness. Thank you for standing up for us. But nobody would help us without a reason. You're here because you want something. Yes, I do. I need to speak with the girl drawn here. Mm. The dead man came for her too. He wanted to take the girl away. But we won't allow her to be hot again. What do you want from Nela? Nela. She was hurt some time ago. I'm here to find the people who did this and bring them to justice. And to find them, I need Nayla's help. Will you let me speak to her? Justice. There's no justice on this land. But you helped us, so maybe your words are not empty. You can speak to Nayla, if she wants it. But I will be watching you. Hello, Nayla? <laughs> My name is Sherlock. I know someone hurt you. I am here to help. I'm trying to find the people involved and bring them to justice, please. There is a photograph, and I'm sorry, it is terrible, but I simply must ask. Where did this happen? What can you tell me about these people? Christ, Sherlock. Nayla, I'm... I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm not... I'm not very good at this. You come here for me, but you are rude and cruel and condescending. A cross. The man had this cross. Now go away. Leave us be. I do not need another white man's help. Oh, glad that wasn't me. Not my best work, John. My long shot. 
Naylor doesn't want us meddling. I'm starting to wonder what this all achieves. But she helped you anyway. Now we know that maniac's face and the cross he wore, we can still catch him. You still here? The intruder has a most peculiar tattoo on his neck, two lines and a point. Do you know anything about it? You really want to know, kid? Why? You want to play a policeman or something? I'm sure you have it in your records, so it won't hurt if I have it in mine. In my records, it's just a tattoo, as it should be in yours. Ah, to hell with you. Suit yourself as to what you're going to do with it. Off the record, though, such tattoos are often connected to a man named Mr. Niccolo Bernadotti. Bernadotti, you say? A respectable businessman in Scaladio. His company imports goods and wines, and smuggles everything that can be smuggled between the colonies and the mainland. His people can be identified by an obscure tattoo. Just like the one over there our friend has. But these are all merely rumors, you see. If Mr. Bernadotti was a criminal, he'd be in prison now. Or hanged, right? The guards at the sewers were speaking about taking refugees out of the camp. Do you know anything about this, Inspector? Less than you do, obviously. And this doesn't bother you as an officer of the law? I can neither punish them nor put them on the right track, if that's what you're asking. Maybe your friends at City Hall could do something about it, but I seriously doubt that. To be honest, I'm sick and tired of being frowned on for my uniform. If those fine gentlemen you've eavesdropped on are in some shady business, that's on their heads. Is this familiar to you? They often take us from the camp to work. Most don't mind, though. It's the only way to get a glimpse of freedom. So there's a smuggling ring in the camp. This wasn't the first time that someone freely entered the camp to take a refugee out. At least it was certainly his last time. My gut tells me that we'll learn more about this ring when we find out where the thug came from. If you're here on matters of signing up for military service, come back tomorrow. Our department needs to straighten out some business. Why are you staring at me like I'm a Madame Tussauds figure? Didn't you hear what I just said? On my way here, I was wondering whether you might regret what you did. I tried my best to retain at least a shred of faith in humanity. I had hoped that you would hear her scream, see her face in your dreams, or at least once ask yourself how Nayla might feel. Who? Neither of my hopes were fulfilled. Why are you here? You really thought that you could escape the consequences. I don't know what you're trying to get from me. Never met anybody named Nayla. Or perhaps you didn't ask the refugee girl while you were violating her. If you're only here to make unfounded accusations, I'd suggest you leave and come back when you have some solid evidence. Might a photograph count as solid evidence? Photograph? So, you've plucked up your courage to finally come here. I won't pay you anything unless I see the photograph for myself. I'm not interested in money. I'm here for justice. Didn't seem like it from the letter you wrote. I've never written a single word to you. That's not my style. I am more... direct. Oh, it appears that more and more people in the city are finding out about your despicable hobby, doesn't it? Fine. I suppose now we have a nice long talk. Do you drink, Mr...? Sherlock Holmes. And I do not. Shame. All the best discussions are accompanied by a glass of whiskey. But out of respect for you, I won't drink either. Respect? That's an unusual word in your mouth, Mr... Where are my manners? My name is Thomas Norton, a British envoy in Cordona on a military mission. So, where do we start? So, let's return to the beginning. What happened at the party? I vaguely remember that night. As usual at such parties, you meet people, you talk with them, they invite you to spend some time alone with them. What can I say? I got myself mixed up with the wrong company, and somebody must have mixed some psychoactive substance in my drink. After that, it's all blurry. I completely lost my sanity. I made a terrible mistake which I regret deeply. You don't say? Do refugee girls often appear on the menu at those types of parties? It's rather rare. So you didn't attend the party to engage in an exotic experience involving a vulnerable woman unable to accuse you of assault? I would never have planned such a terrible thing. What happened was just... bad circumstance. The painting that depicted you in the image of the devil was stolen by a mercenary. Did you have anything to do with it? 
I might be a rotten person, sir, but hiring criminals for illicit purposes is not in my daily schedule. And buying the painting in an attempt to hide the crime, is that on your daily schedule? What would you do in my situation? I would never put myself in such a situation. You're young. I could never have imagined myself in my current position. Yet, here I am in front of you. We all make mistakes, Mr. Holmes. And I'm no exception. You mentioned blackmail. Tell me about it. All right. A couple of days ago, I received an anonymous letter. It said that in the art gallery at Caravansary, there exists a painting that incriminates me. The blackmailer made it clear that if there is a painting, then a photograph exists too. And I should be wary of what it might do to my reputation. What does the blackmailer want from you? Money, of course. What else do such people want? Needless to say, I don't remember anyone taking photographs at the party. Up until the last moment, I hoped he was bluffing. But he wasn't, as you've just proven to me. Show me the letter. I burnt it as soon as I read it. I've left enough evidence. There's no need for any more. Boniface Mercurio, does the name mean anything to you? He's an artist, right? The one responsible for the painting that compromises you. I found him dead in his room. Oh, that is bad. Wait, you don't think that I have anything to do with this? You had motive to kill him. Maybe I did, but listen. I know how this looks, but murder? That's on another level. I had thoughts that this Mercutio... Mercurio. Well, him, yes. I thought he could have been the blackmailer. But I was too afraid to make any hasty decisions. There were plenty of ways to fail by making a move, so I chose to wait. To see what he would do next. You have to believe me. I don't believe people. I believe evidence. Then look at the evidence. Mr. Holmes, I've built my entire career on hard work and uncompromising dedication to the Crown. I made a mistake. But I'm not a villain from some cheap adventure fiction. By putting me behind bars, you will benefit precisely no one. Rotting in prison is the least you deserve, but I have a better idea. You will make amends and help the ones you hurt. Nayla deserves the very utmost of what you can do. Help the girl? I can't risk the press paying extra attention to her. I will do anything except that. That's not all. Use your connections to help patriate the refugees, find them decent homes, give them jobs. There must be a meaning to your position and my decision. Yes, all right, I can do that. So, will you give me the photograph now? I need to think this all through. Don't do anything foolish in the meantime. What makes you think you can decide what's best for these people? Such is the arrogance of British imperialism. I take your point. Hey, yo, this is private property. You lost something. My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm investigating a robbery, and Mr. Bernadotti may be just the man to help me with... Yo, a copper. I have nothing to do with the police. I... Mr. Bernadotti isn't seeing anyone. You have three seconds to walk away or you'll never walk again. Capito? It's in Mr. Bernadotti's best interest to... One... I did try to resolve this peacefully. An amazing piece of culture. I imagine many collectors and museums would be interested in having it. Let's see what's hidden there. Vogel's stolen painting. Isn't it curious how it developed into a much more interesting case? A Dogon statue from West Africa. Masks, traditional for the Chokwe people of Central Africa. VH Grindley Flow Blue Tableware. This is what lies behind the facade of Bernadotti Company Limited. Don't come any closer. One step and I'll stretch it to pieces. Keep standing in my way and no one will ever see you again. Right, oh, yes. Yep, well, uh, excuse me, sir. I, I think I hear... I've got to... It's better I leave. Whoa. Oh, wow. That was as if somebody put my words in your mouth. So, you've cut through all the guards just to talk to me. Then come here and we shall talk. Whenever you're ready. I'd hate to intrude. Bad news. The thug you sent to the refugee camp only succeeded in stabbing himself. His next and final journey will be to the morgue. Hold your horses. Who the hell are you? Sherlock Holmes. 
And you are Niccolo Bernadotti, a smuggler, kidnapper, and notorious cutthroat, among other things. Few men would dare waltz into my office and address me like that. You are either overconfident or unintelligent. This is private property. Give me one reason why I should not shoot you on this spot. I am sure my friends at the station would call it self-defense. I was hired, privately, to investigate the recent theft of a painting from an art gallery. My investigation led me to a man from your organization and, thus, to you, Mr. Bernadotti. That is quite a stretch. Why would I need to steal a painting when I could buy any one I wanted? Interestingly enough, I spotted the stolen painting in your storeroom. I buy and sell a lot of things, Mr. Holmes. Unfortunately, if this is true, it is not the first time I have been sold stolen merchandise. I presume you were hired by the owner of the gallery. Tell them to contact me, and we'll sort out the situation. So, this painting is why you broke into my office. Mr. Bernadotti, do you know the name Boniface Mercurio? I do not. Mercurio was a local artist. Recently, a man broke into his apartment, ransacked the place, and killed him. The thief was looking for something. You are testing my patience, boy. In a moment, the connection will reveal itself. As I said, your man was found dead in the refugee camp. He was there to kidnap a woman, but the other refugees intervened to try and save her. The ensuing scuffle resulted in the man's accidental suicide. He sported the same tattoo as your men in this building. In fact, it also bears a resemblance to the one on your neck. Care to explain what business your man had with this woman? You have no idea what you are talking about. I can assure you this was no kidnapping. The refugees in the camp are on edge. What happened there is a tragic accident, one I am not responsible for. For what reason was your man there if not to abduct her? Why would I answer? You are yet to justify your presence in the slightest. So many words, so little action. When you barged into my office, Mr. Holmes, I got the impression you wanted to talk business. Now I see you had come just to talk. Tell me exactly what you want, or get out. It was necessary groundwork for what comes next. I have enough evidence to conclude that the gallery thief, the artist's killer, and the dead man in the camp are all the same person. Your time is almost up, Mr. Holmes. Before you draw your gun, there is one final detail I am yet to mention. The young woman your man was tasked to collect from the refugee camp had been defiled at a perverse masquerade party. That violation was captured in a photograph by Boniface Mercurio and used as a reference for his painting. The photo shows the attacker's face. Finally. That's why you're here, Mr. Holmes. You have the photograph. It is what your man was after when he broke into Mercurio's apartment, and it is what you're after too, isn't it, Mr. Bernadotti? You have the photograph with you. How much do you want for it? I am not naive enough to carry it with me, but I am yet to decide what I shall do with it. I know the man in the photo is a British envoy. What interest do you have in his downfall? I must admit, I am rather impressed by how comprehensively you have pursued this matter. And so, you deserve the honest answer. My business dealings are often arduous in their bureaucracy. A man in his position, willing to look the other way, could ease my work significantly. In return, I will make sure no one looks his way either. A favor for a favor. Also known as blackmail, the modus operandi of any true professional. It was not originally my idea. Mercurio set things in motion, extorting the envoy for the most trivial of ends. Money. In response, the envoy hired my man to retrieve the painting and the photograph, eliminating Mercurio's leverage. I only learned the whole story after the artist was killed in his home. And rather than extricate yourself, instead you took over Mercurio's venture. It fell into my lap. As a businessman, I simply seized the opportunity. Now, how much do you want for the image? Why did you send your man to remove the woman from the camp? Without a photograph, her testimony was the next best thing. Securing her was in everyone's interest. Victims and witnesses all too often disappear. I thought the girl was cipher with us. I did not anticipate what would happen at the camp. Why should I give you the photograph? 
Just name your price. What if my price were not money? You claim to have connections, Mr. Bernadotti. Perhaps you could improve conditions for the refugees. Give them a chance for a better life. Ha! <laughs> I do have connections, Mr. Holmes. But help the whole camp? You are asking too much. I could, however, make arrangements for one person. The woman who was violated will have her own home, outside the camp, solely for her and her child. She will no longer be a refugee, but a princess. That I can guarantee. Is that really possible? It will be neither fast nor easy, but I can do it. She deserves it, don't you agree? And as for her abuser, he will serve me as much as he deserves. So in your plan, everybody will be given their due. Especially you, Mr. Bernadotti. Seems like a fair deal. No? I doubt anyone could offer you better. Simply give me the photograph, and the world becomes a better place. I give you my word. Mr. Holmes, you've returned. Have you uncovered anything new about the theft? I've brought news, but not all of it will please you. Fill me in, Mr. Holmes. I won't shoot the messenger. I located the thief, but found him rather cold. He was tight-lipped about the painting, too. Ha! Huh, he's dead. How very droll, Mr. Holmes. Warren presumes you were not responsible. It was an accident at the refugee camp. He impaled himself on his own knife. Life is nothing if not cruel and capricious. I tracked down Boniface Mercurio. I presume he wasn't delighted about the situation. He was not having a good day on account of his murder, killed in his own flat by the same person that stole his painting. Oh, sweet Mercurio, perishing in the pursuit of his art. How apt. I will miss his exceptional sense of humor. What about the stolen painting? Have you located it? I found the painting, but I could not retrieve it. Well then, where is it? In Bernadotti's office. Bernadotti? That shady businessman? Why would he steal it from me? I'm afraid you'll have to ask him yourself. Hmm. I take it you found something more, then. I found the source of Mercurio's artistic inspiration. A photograph. What troubled me was that the sexual act captured was non-consensual. She was violated? Dear God, how despicable. Her abuser was in fact the British envoy. Mercurio took a picture of him committing the atrocity and then used it as... Artistic inspiration. I had no idea a mere break-in would eventually expose such barbarity. Mr. Vogel, I want you to make everything public, including the photograph. I'm sure you have a connection at the Cordona Chronicle. Ah, Mr. Holmes, loyal to your own truth till the end. Yes, I'm acquainted with the staff of the Chronicle. The story is sensational and will surely draw attention to the gallery. But you must be aware that exposing the scandal will further hurt the victim. Does that not bother you? No matter what one does, the truth tends to come out, as well it should. I won't be the one to stand in its way. Though it's only your subjective truth being exposed. Not that I'm judging. It's perfectly reasonable for everyone to have their own views. When you called me, you knew exactly what you would get. Oh, but I'm not like you, Mr. Holmes. I cannot be sure of anything. Regardless, I must thank you, for art's sake. Well, now that we've resolved all of our outstanding matters, I have a gift for you. I took the liberty of having it delivered to Stonewood Manor. I am told it belonged to your mother. And what exactly have you sent me? Frankly, I'm not sure how to answer that. I trust you'll know. Previously, you mentioned there may have been more to my mother's passing than consumption. It appears you were right. Oh, dear. I'd hoped to be wrong. She was unstable, mentally unwell. She required sustained specialized treatment, but her madness persisted. I knew that Violet had disappeared from the public eye, but had no idea of her suffering. I cannot imagine what you're feeling. I'm fine. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. I am curious to see what you have procured. It's a bizarre object, and yet oddly familiar.
Did you just remember something? Yes. A room full of curiosities and artifacts. I think I can find it in the manor. Sherlock. So, you continue to pursue the imaginary. I had hoped you might have got all this out of your system by now. Mycroft. What are you doing here? Get out of my house! It's my house, actually. I've come to bring you back. I have no interest in returning, let alone with you. I know you lied about Mother all these years, claiming she was merely ill, but she was unstable. She never had tuberculosis. She was not recuperating, but mentally deteriorating, and you never once thought to tell me how dare... I shall not indulge this petulant tantrum. You can just tire yourself out and then slink back to London with your tail between your legs. Just tell me everything! I'm an adult now. Show me the basic courtesy of an explanation. You know what I will find out eventually. The goal was stability, and that's what you got. The right thing for everyone was to try and move on from her passing. The consequences of one's actions determines what is right or wrong. Yes, exactly. The ends justify the means. After leaving Cordona, Sherlock, you had a normal childhood. In London, I was able to support you, guide you, shape you into a fine and productive young man. You have so much potential, so much to offer society. But that's not the end. Now I've found the truth, and it has shattered everything I knew about her, about you, and about myself. I feel unstable because of you. Your actions were not justified. Lying never is. Oh, grow up, Sherlock. It was a white lie which has as much use in the realm of the interpersonal as the international. It is time you come to accept that some things are bigger than yourself. Oh, you are full of it. You like to pretend you care about the big picture, but it's just an ego trip. You like knowing more than others. You like greasing palms and rubbing shoulders with the rich and powerful. You like having eyes and ears everywhere. The fact it helps the nation is incidental. Because all you care about is yourself. It's true. I have agents everywhere, including Cordona. If you weren't so damn stubborn, you'd realize that means I'm only here for you. I remember returning home with a pair of perfect sticks. We wanted to turn them into training swords. Oh, that's right. We stood there, frozen, staring at something huge in the main hall. It was a giant aquarium with a living mermaid in it. Impossible. It must have been something else. Oh, of course. That mortifying hoax presently taking up space in our front yard. Well, fine. Your memory's better than mine. But I'm sure we started examining it immediately. And someone else was around, too. It was my mother. She asked what I thought of the artifact. You were really concentrating and holding something in your hand. I inspected it with a magnifying glass and was able to confirm it was made of two different skeletons. The mermaid was a fake. And so it was time to smash the thing. Your mother took a hammer and... Slow down, John. That's not how it happened. I remember other people joined us. The workers took the artifact and placed it into the Cabinet of Curiosities. It became part of Mother's collection of fakes. She always said that the truth lies in the details. This mermaid helped me to learn that. Ah yes, my mother's studio. She was an authenticator and this was her Cabinet of Curiosities. I never saw the point. What does it matter if some artifact is real or not? It still exists. One of the most ridiculous fakes I ever saw. Its owner insisted it was a polar bear. He thought the white paint on the brown fur wasn't noticeable. I remember this cosy blanket. It was perfect for... Wigwam! Oh, that was a joy to build them. Imagining ourselves as wayfarers on the other side of the world. Dated 24th of April, 1869. So many calling cards. Mycroft liked to keep useful people at hand. Reliable and driven, I recognize my cross handwriting. Officer Luciano J. Placido. 
This drawer it was always closed. Only Mycroft knew how to open it. I remember we tried to break it open and spy on him, but alas, had no success. Maybe today's the day. Ah, oh, Sherry. 1852, Bingley, West Yorkshire. This photo caused a lot of fuss. My mother spent some time to prove it was a fake. Look, it's Roger. This jolly old man's well preserved. He even looks refreshed. I doubt he drew much interest at the auction. That's for the best. I'd be upset if he fell into the wrong hands. The so called mummy of a Persian princess. The defrauders did good work, but missed one small detail. It's the mummy of a man. Another fake Holy Grail. Its owner claimed to be the heir of King Arthur. Scarcely believable. He also insisted a deadly rabbit was hunting him. Mother said this was among the hunting trophies of a Scottish Viscount. So he tried to persuade everyone that his forest was inhabited by these beasts. It would have been the full plate armour of Sir Robert Saunford. True. I was told my father won it in a wager. Armour is armour, but look at his sword. Oh, how badly I wanted to wield the blade. Maybe you take it instead of your pistol. Ah, the memory comes back. We snuck about watching him. He closed the drawer and went to the hall. We were like two shadows crawling behind him. He opened the door to the postman and they exchanged documents. If it was a real postman, of course. The painting on the wall was slightly a tilt. He stopped and straightened it. Then he threw some logs into the fire and sat in his armchair to read. It's as boring now as it was then. I'm sorry, Sherry, but I think that's it. Wait, John, we never use the fireplace in the mornings. A bit of juniper in the fireplace created a soothing atmosphere. It's the little things, isn't it? I think this is what we're looking for. Dossiers on the most influential people on Cordona. Mycroft always had a habit of building files on everyone he met. Single malt whiskey. Mycroft's favourite. Gifted by Queen Victoria herself. Otto Richter. This one is rather thick. Mycroft can be truly dogged in his research. I use this ladder to look at the top shelf, right? On the day of Mother's breakdown upstairs. Right you are, Sherry. We heard a noise. I can't recall of exactly what. And we didn't have a great view from behind the statue. The books and papers from the table somehow ended up on the floor. Now it's coming to the surface. I feel it. Come on, Sherry. Let's go outside. Wait. Did you hear that? Come here, Sherry. You call this progress? Charlatan, amateur. I'm not letting you anywhere near my mother again. So there was a quarrel between them. There's a costume party. Welcome, sir. I do hope you enjoy yourself. Enjoy the evening, sir. There is still plenty of time before the grand finale. All right. Sure, you'd come. Berna, I uh, see you are not yourself. The more time you spend here in Cordona, the more I feel it my duty to bring you into our world and show you all we have to offer. 
And what is on offer today? Pleasure, indulgence, relief, and relaxation. You've earned some time for yourself, have you not? Those who know me would say I'm incapable of it. <laughs> Nonsense. I refuse to believe there is anyone permitted to know Sherlock Holmes. Huh. You may be right. Then free yourself from inhibition and expectation. The night is young, and so are the guests. You should try to enjoy both. It's not healthy for handsome men to spend every night alone, and certainly not in a house filled with such melancholic memories. I must admit, my travels have proven more taxing than expected. I'm less confident in my life and myself. A time of relaxation seems a distant dream. So can I tempt you with a physical aid to your moral consolations? There's wine, of course, and something to smoke, or perhaps an artificial paradise? Yes, something more spiritual, a potentiator to sharpen the mind. A 7% solution of, well, that'd be telling, but you must try it. My mind is my most valuable asset and a finely tuned instrument. I will not risk impeding its function. My ultimate duty is to provide the world with truth, and I do that perfectly well as is. Duty? You've never cared about that before. Of course I do. Exposing a lie, revealing a fact, that is a moral responsibility. <laughs> That's not morality. Morals are what happens afterwards when truth collides with consequence. Do you ever follow up on cases you solved? Do you ever see what happened next, visit the victims, ensure justice is served in the courts? And how do you choose where to direct your attention? Are there not deserving causes to which your brilliance could be applied but isn't? You ascribe me more power than I possess. I have a narrow skill set and work within that mandate. What occurs afterward is irrelevant. With every action or inaction, you place a finger on the scales of morality. Many in the city would see you as abdicating your responsibility. I, I haven't. Not me, of course. Morality is subjective, just like truth. There is little to be gained from indulging in it, and far better things to indulge in. Now I must insist on easing any burdens I've placed upon your shoulders. Show yourself a kindness, and try this rather delectable concoction. If this solution truly does assist with thinking, then... Perhaps it would be puerile to overlook an opportunity to study it. I'll take it with me. Yes, Sherlock. Very good. And now, our evening begins in earnest. <laughs> I just remembered. I'm sorry, Sherlock. My mind's delightfully impaired. Please take this key. It opens the altar room, past the library. Pardon? Altar room? What now, Verna? Go quickly and find our Fabio. Only you can make him talk. I'll join you in a minute. My God. Was he here this whole time? The herbs here are salvia divinorum. They have a slight hallucinogenic effect to emphasize the ceremony. This elaborate box must be for the ritual dagger. The ointment smells mouse-like. I presume it is an aphrodisiac prepared from a Spanish fly. This one looks like a twisted symbol of Venus drawn in a hurry. The sign reminds me of the astrological symbol for Mars. A sturdy bottle met a not so sturdy human. It didn't break only because it was unopened. The pitcher is empty, but with puddles around it. Blood clots are adhered to the sides of the drain. Identical to the robes the guests are wearing. Useful tool for a disguise arsenal. Handcrafted and luxurious cufflinks. There's also a note. For my Fabio, Banchos. The key is similar to the one that Vogel gave me. The capital F on the key fob might refer to Fabio. Would you recognize me in one of these? I suppose not. Similar to the guests' robes, apart from the bloodstains. A blunt force trauma may have suffered an internal hemorrhage.
This crew tattoo partially covers a slave branding. The dagger is heavy and sharp, but lacks balance. This golden handle has a blood stain on it. This worm-like sigil has been drawn with his own blood. The victim has clenched the fabric so firmly in his fist that it's nigh impossible to remove it. The wound is deep. A precise strike reached the heart. He died right here. Werner, care to explain what is going on here? On nights like these, it's not unusual for some attendees to get a little... exuberant. It's part of the appeal. Unfortunately, it appears things have gotten out of hand. Yes, some are more prone to bend the rules of morality. That's murder. I doubt there's anything left to bend. Why did you not tell me immediately? We were chatting about trivial matters for some time. If I'm completely honest, Sherlock, I've consumed a rather potent cocktail of substances. My attention slips and drifts, but I'm glad I thought to call for you. You sent me a disguise. Oh dear, did I? Well, since I found the body, Mr. Manchios has agreed that you can investigate the matter. I promise my mind will behave itself going forward. All right. Pull yourself together, Werner. Mr. Manchios is the owner of the manor, yes? And the host of Cordona's most memorable parties. He promises even the ugliest guest a partner for the night. And for the ones with more unconventional tastes, Mr. Manchios provides other services. What a caring person. You cannot begin to imagine. The police remain unaware of this tragic event? Some of them may be hiding behind their masks. They conceal many things. But we didn't want the authorities to create more problems. Besides, after a few cocktails, their incompetence will have soared to new heights. How do you know I even want the case? I promised you relaxation. If there's one thing I know about you, Sherlock, it's that nothing soothes you more than a good mystery. How did you discover the body, in between guzzles of alcohol? I was set to perform in a fecundity ride with Fabio and came to inquire further. It was a staged ritual where he was to play the principle of life. And the rehearsal was unsuccessful? Ha! Huh. Who knows? I found him alone on the altar, his blood dripping to the floor. And then? Then I called Mr. Manchios. He was panicking, so I told him about you. We left the room and locked the door. Then we were... Filling time. Waiting for you was stressful. We indulged in some simple comforts. Overindulged, perhaps. Were you well acquainted with Fabio, the victim? Everyone knew Fabio, or wanted to. His beauty was the talk of the island. Too handsome to go unnoticed. He was magnetic. Fat wallets fought for the privilege of having him. He offered the pleasures of performance, and more. What about the fertility ritual? There was something about Fabio being a principle of life. Fabio was supposed to portray the beauty of life's origin. Flowers, oil, not this travesty that seems straight out of the Inquisition. So this ritual is not the fertility rite. What was it meant to look like? It begins with a woman lying naked in a flower bed on the altar. She represents Gaia, the earth. As I cover her in oils, we chant for the principal. As our calls reach a climax, Fabio enters and copulates with her. After he finishes, I stab her with a dagger. That part's just pretend, of course. But the intercourse is not? I did not expect you to be such a prude. Are you a virgin? It is nothing to be ashamed of, but it would explain the colour of your cheeks. The fertility rite marks the start of our festivities. The principle of life is beautiful, intimate, essential. It must not be stopped. <sighs> Yet it appears that someone did stop it. What about the naked woman? Can you tell me anything about her? Oh, yes, Matista. She's one of Fabio's compatriots and a performer, too. I haven't seen her today, actually. When you discovered the body, was the door open? No, it was locked. Oh, that reminds me. It's a minor detail, but the first time I came to speak to Fabio, I left without entering, having been unable to open the door. You didn't have the key? No, I had it. Don't look at me like that. I was mostly sober. I suspect there was a key in the other side of the door, blocking the lock. That detail may very well be major, Werner. Well done. So you returned later, only to find the lock was not blocked? Correct. After an hour had passed, 
I tried again and was able to unlock the door. That's when I discovered poor, handsome Fabio. A person leaned against the doorframe. They left a smudged trail of blood. A bloody handprint on an arm. The wounded person was here for some time. There appeared to be no further traces leading to the altar. So, Sherry, do you have any ideas about the case? Perhaps, perhaps. I think I can deduce what happened here. The bottle was used as a weapon during a scuffle in the smoking lounge. Then, to ensure no one would interrupt, the murderer locked the door. The unconscious body of the victim was moved to the altar room. Once the body was on the altar, the murderer thrust the dagger into the victim's heart. Symbols were drawn with the blood. The wardrobe was used to hide the bloodied robe from anyone's eyes. The killer washed himself and took a clean robe from the hangar before leaving. Are you all right? You're on the floor, not moving. I think I know what happened here. I'm starting to put the pieces together. Fabio was stabbed. I see nothing gets past you, Werner. Yes, he was stabbed, but only after being knocked out in the next room and placed here. I do not yet know why. So who's responsible? Well, it was one person working alone, and the murderer has now donned a robe. He or she could be hiding in plain sight. We have lost time, Werner, but your discretion may prove to be a benediction after all. Let me see what I can do about all this. The murderer had to have access to this room. After the crime, he used his own key to lock the door. So, who had the key to the altar room? I'm not sure. As a special guest, I was provided one by Mr. Manchios. He should be able to tell you of any others. Where can I find him? Most likely in the main hall, entertaining his guests. He has a mask with golden stars. You can't miss him. But please be discreet. We don't want to risk disturbing the revelry. Hurt Manchios, I presume? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Oh, you must be the one Werner told me about. What a sweet voice you have. It must belong to a handsome young man. Can I call you Sherlock? As you wish, Mr. Manchios. Mr. Vogel asked me to help you. The body in the altar room requires answers, and quickly, I suspect the murderer to still be here. What? Lower your voice. I don't want anyone to hear us. I need to find all those who had the key to the altar room. As far as I know, Mr. Vogel, Fabio, and you had access to it. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Also, Matista and Santos. Santos? Who is that? Santos Pinchetti, my major domo, in his opinion at least. I'd like to speak to Mr. Pinchetti and Matista. Do you have somewhere I might have a private conversation with them? Of course, of course. Let me think. Matista is entertaining the guests somewhere, and Santos... Oh, yes. He will be busy with the servants. Or the cook. What's that noise? What's going on? Freeze, filth. You're under arrest. Look at you. Committed a crime, and now I have to free you, kiss your hand, and apologize for the inconvenience. I did tell you that Mr. Vogel and I were innocent. I emphasized it in my statement. Your statement? Thanks to some bigwigs who work for the so-called good of the country by releasing fleas like you. Thank God we have Vogel in this letter. Once I get to that goldfish, I'll... Bigwig? Oh, my wretched brother Mycroft and his long nose. Wait. Did you say Mycroft? Mycroft Holmes? 
Are you the youngest son of Violet, Holmes? Rest her soul. You knew my mother? Not personally, no. Not exactly. I was working on the paperwork for that case. Would you happen to remember anything of the events? Well, I didn't make the inquiry, but I remember seeing some notes. Why? Perhaps we can negotiate. I could be quite useful. Huh. Got you hooked, right? You know what? Stark and the others think they're the smartest here, thanks to you. Let me get this straight. Are you listening to me, lad? I'm all ears. Take this case. Report to me only, to Constable Harvey Oswald. I'll leave everything I have on this table. Find the murderer. Be a real copper. Question the suspects, make them sing, give me something substantial. And if Mr. Vogel is not a suspect? If he's innocent, then you can take your favourite degenerate away from here. If you slip or mess with the evidence, then trust me, your brother won't save you from my bludgeon. Meanwhile, I'll be checking the archive for you. If anybody asks, then you're a consulting detective. Let's make a start, then. Partner. Good day, Mr. Manchios. I am Constable Oswald's partner in this investigation. Be quick and gentle. Some of your colleagues are untrained bores. Although I don't mind meeting young officers, the new blood here. If you cooperate in finding Fabio's murderer, there will be no need to meet with the bores again. That voice. Vernus, friend? You're the policeman. What a disappointment. Only an undercover agent can scour a ditch full of deviants. I am a consulting detective. Although I'm capable of replacing the entire department through my consultations. Sharp-tongued, I like it. May I presume this tongue will get us out of this trouble? I would be so indebted and glad to repay you. Nothing's changed. I'm looking for the murderer. That's the only way to get us out of trouble. But it shouldn't take much time, correct? We're all busy, after all. I need to examine you first. You are a little over the top with your use of makeup, Mr. Manchios. Is it so difficult for you to acknowledge your age? Well, Sherlock, that's easy for you to say to an old man when you look as though you are barely 15. But still, it shouldn't be an issue for someone of your status. For people of my age, it isn't an issue, no. But the younger ones can be so afraid of wrinkles and grey flecks. I have to adapt. Such a methodical man who cares for his body but misses the soap under his fingernails. Are you so impatient, or perhaps even impulsive? I wouldn't call myself that. Silly little details. If I missed it, it wasn't important. Or rather, it was less important than who or what I was focused on. You bought an expensive pair of cufflinks for Fabio. Were they his price? Or were they a tip for an exclusive show? It was pure business. Fabio escorted me a few times. I was merely showing my gratitude. This pair cost a small fortune. You must be extremely grateful, then. Tell me more. You've thrust a knife in an exposed nerve, Sherlock. Yes, he was my protege and my beacon also. With my experience and his beauty, we could have achieved anything. I had faith in him. I would have made him. Do you have any idea who tipped off the police to raid your mansion, Mr. Manchios? Of course. It was you. I could even say you Sherlocked me in here. A good guess, but the wrong one. The fellow who did that was Mr. Pinchetti, your major domo. What? Santos? But how could he even know? If he's not the murderer himself. The ungrateful swine. He has dared to besmirch my reputation. Not a very eloquent choice of words. What should I call him then, since he's a snitch? Make him talk, Sherlock. I'm quite certain he knows more about the murder than he has told the police. What was Fabio like? His personality, his habits. Anything you can tell me? He was the brightest star of my parties. Young, magnetic, and full of energy. I don't even want to mention his beauty. Otherwise, I'll be sobbing. An expensive champion, I imagine. His performances were flawless. He deserved his payment. Do you think he was murdered because of money? Possibly. What about the other guests? Were they used to opening their wallets as well? I wouldn't restrict my guests from anything. I'm sure Fabio received a few coins from others for his services. 
Mr. Vogel told me a little about your Parsis, but I would like to know more directly from you. I'm all yours, Sherlock. You have me arrested and locked here, with you alone. I'd like to know who you usually invite to your parties. Free minds who are able to leave reality for an evening, who can taste forbidden fruit without prejudice. There is nothing that quite spices up life like these parties, assuming one is old enough and has worked many years for the good of one's country. Oh, all true laborers, I see. Why did you invite Mr. Vogel as your special guest? He's a pretty fellow. He's capable of surprising the public. He has a talent for saying words that no one else would wish to either say or hear. I suppose I can't argue with that. He is a free addition to the eccentricity of the party, which is fine by me, as long as it enhances my party. I'm Sherlock Holmes. I'm helping Constable Oswald. You are Matista, Fabio's friend. This body, yes. It's Matista, but it's a mere shell that will die someday, just like Fabio. Fabio knew the risks. Selling his body to degenerates who hid behind robes and masks, it could not end well. That's only your distorted understanding of safety. Officers here, they wear robes and masks too. It's a dangerous lifestyle, but it's not as though we were given many other choices. I'm just here to ask questions and find Fabio's murderer. <sighs> It will not bring Fabio back. You have both old and new scars. Some from the time when you were a slave with Fabio. Other scars have a different origin. The guests pay good money to torment you? I am skilled in giving pleasure, but I don't participate in such practices. I thought your body was... For sale. It's true. Many unwanted things were done to my body. And the pain helped me to discover... Occult deities? Yes, the tattoo speaks loudly of it. Yes. Your gods abandoned me, and the ones I favor now are more protective of me. How did you escape? Something happened. One night the master fell down the stairs. I made him fall, and he died. We ran away that day. We managed to get on a ship and traveled here, to Gordona. Fabio and I started a new life here. It was very hard at first, but it became better with time. Until today. The bruises on your neck are not self-inflicted. Someone else made them. Some guests can't contain themselves. They even bite, sometimes. Werner, are you all right? Oh, yes, yes. Everything's fine. In fact, it's something of a family reunion. My brother spent quite some time in this place himself. You should not be here. I told the police everything I knew, but they refused to let you go. They require proof to free you. Ha! What did you expect? The mighty Sherlock Holmes swans in, tells the officers what to think, and the world obeys? Of course not. Anyway, I struck a deal with the constable, and I've got a free hand in the investigation. I find proof to solve the case for him. He obtains files about my mother's death for me. Well done. If one has the power or will and can act, then one must. I wonder... Suppose you couldn't get the proof to your truth. Would you tell a lie to the guard that enabled my freedom, knowing my innocence? Would that not be just? There are lines I will not cross, Verna. I will do my best to secure your release, but with proof, not deception. Really? How many white lies have you told on this island? Why not for me? Why not another? That is absurd. I can resolve this without compromises. Do not give up hope. I have learned who told the police about the crime. It was Santos Pinchetti. Do I know him? The major domo of the manor. He cleans up after you? Well, then he does his job perfectly. All but invisible. I couldn't tell you the first thing about him. Have you considered Mr. Santos Pinchetti as a suspect? The snitch? Have you seen him? I mean, my breath could knock him down. What's so special about him? As a major domo, he has keys that open all the rooms, including the one to the crime scene could have testified only to circumvent suspicion, don't you think? We need to question him. Right. I'll send our men to fetch him. Stay here. They brought him in, Mr. Holmes. Here's the key to interrogation room number seven. Mr. Pinchetti didn't even resist, our men said. Thank you. Mr. Pinchetti, a pleasure to meet you. I'm Sherlock Holmes. I'm helping Constable Oswald. I've already told him everything I know. I'm only a witness, sir. Everything's in my report. And I've read it. 
You forgot to mention that you hold the keys to the room where Fabio was found. I need only to find if the crime was intentional. But I need to return to my duties. I doubt the house will fall without you, Mr. Pinchetti. Just be still for a few seconds. You are the major domo of a rich mansion, and you seem barely able to afford decent clothing. You hide, under heavy makeup, a skin disease that might be treated with more onerous but less harmful means. Do you have money troubles? I do not have a lot of means. The pay is below what you might expect. But you could easily change your job if your employer does not meet your elementary needs. One can change his employer, that is true. And the blood on your shoe, where does that come from? I don't actually know. Perhaps from a guest? Did you know Fabio? Uh, not personally. He was a frequent guest, and cleaning the mess after his performances was tedious. Mr. Manchios always had a role for him, and mainly the leading one. The parties were always um, Fabio-centric. And Batista? Was she as popular as her partner? Don't tell her I said this, but I do not think so. Mr. Manchios hired her only because Fabio refused to work without her. Mr. Manchios used to see her as a worker. She was tasked with entertaining the guests, unlike Fabio, who could pick and choose. Mr. Manchios says that you begged him to be included in the heritage. Isn't that a little extreme, even for a major domo? He's not only my employer, he's my uncle. And I'm his next of kin. The only one. Mr. Manchios flatly refuses to pay a family member. All I have to do is repay his so-called love cleaning up the filth after perverts and decadence. He's imprisoned me. The best I can hope for is a new broom. That's why I wanted to have my part of the inheritance. Is it that bad? You have a roof above your head, a salary, and the status of a major domo. For God's sake. I'm forced to dye and stitch my threadbare clothes, and the holes in my shoes are painful. I'm ashamed every time a guest looks at me closely. Why do you think your uncle treats you this way? My mother, my uncle's sister, had me illegitimately. She died and I was given the surname of one of the maids. But you are entitled to some of the money that belongs to your family. He thinks not. I was not responsible for my mother's death. I work hard and he pays me nothing. I feed on the leftovers. While he wastes our estate's property on decadent parties, he paid Fabio handsomely and showered him with expensive gifts for their disgusting relationship. I've read the letter about your will. A harsh method of ridiculing Santos. I doubt he will use mustache wax when he wears no mustache to begin with. Where did you get it? Is the slug here? Tell him I shouldn't have to provide for him. He's a grown man who shouldn't sit on his uncle's neck. He conceives himself as my only heir. And who is he to you? He's a leech on my aging body. He has only added problems to my life since the death of his mother. I fail to see why you made him your major domo. He needed to know his place, so I taught him. There is undeniable evidence that you were the original recipient of this letter. What are you talking about? Is it addressed to me? Your protege wanted a fresh start, it seems. This is sufficient to charge you. Me? Hurt my star? Are you insane that you would accuse me of such a thing? He did not consider himself as yours. Since you deny everything, let's move on. Do you have any idea as to how the letter could have ended up in Mr. Vogel's pocket? You were the detective. Perhaps he took it from Fabio. Werner was a little high. Do you recognize this book? Could Matista have borrowed it from your library? She didn't ask me. How ungrateful. The things described in the book were inspiration for the rituals you performed? Do you really believe that blood, symbols, and incantations can resurrect the dead? They are just eerie tales with a mix of occultism and voodoo. My rituals are a stage to show some of the forbidden pleasures. This book, The Power of Love, Blood, and Mandrake, what do you hope to achieve? To learn more about the invisible strengths that govern us. Occultism is real. The master who fell that night when Fabio and I escaped I made him fall. I cast a spell on him and it worked. Or was it a coincidence? The universe is really so lazy. If you say so, could Fabio have written this letter to Kurt Manchios? Oh, that could be. 
I never thought Mr. Manchios could make Fabio that angry, though. What do you mean? Well, Fabio wanted to disassociate from Mr. Manchios. Clients who are in love are both a blessing and a curse. But Fabio was here tonight. Money. In our line of work, we can't afford to turn down clients who pay as well as Kurt Manchios. Was Fabio afraid of Mr. Manchios? Not at all. The old toad wouldn't dare to do more than sweet talk and touching. Talk can be forgotten, and touching washed away. Do you practice occult rituals? For protection? For fortune? To wash away the ugliness of the world? Sometimes to survive. I have the gift, and I'm learning to use it better. Did you use your gift on Fabio? I only used white magic. Love charms lately. Fabio became so distant. I just wanted him to be with me, but I suppose I'm not as skilled as I thought. I have reason to believe that the intended recipient of the incriminating letter may have been Kurt Manchios. Well, that makes sense. Too bad I can't remember how I came to possess it. Though I did spend quite some time with Mr. Manchios during the party. Unfortunately, even with an answer, that may still not be enough to clear you with the police. But fear not. I will persevere. I hope your attempt to put things straight will make up for... You being on a bender. Touché. The murder of Fabio did not have a ritual purpose, Mr. Manchios. It was staged by a man who wished to distract the investigation. That might be true. That poor girl, Matista, wouldn't dare to kill the only man who cared for her. So, Santos? Mr. Pinchetti snatched at the chance to solve his problems. Ungrateful little scum. Will he be executed? But what for? He informed the police as to the crime, that was all. He couldn't stage the ritual, but he found the body, I believe. I can't believe it. Why did Werner do it? Mr. Vogel. He had no reason, and he won't be a scapegoat as you plan. You put Fabio's letter in his pocket when he was intoxicated, didn't you? You can't be serious. We can very often deduce someone's life by their shoes, or their fingernails. You are a meticulous person, but this murder was fairly traumatic and filthy. After you stabbed Fabio, you were covered in blood. You panicked and neglected to rinse the soap from under your fingernails. The devil is in the details, Mr. Manchos. Nonsense. I missed it simply because of the busy schedule of the party. Of course, a staged murder was certainly not planned. You're at the twilight of your life. You have no partner, you have no children. You had feelings, however, for one man. That was Fabio. You loved him. That is, you wished to own him with money and gifts. But he was also a free mind, was he not? He turned his back on you. Quite unjust, love, so cruel and painful, and Fabio, with his words and deeds, made you feel the more wretched. So you killed him. You must surely perceive that my sensitive nature wouldn't allow me to hurt anyone. You staged the murder as a satanic ritual. It was easy for you, since you were the one who wrote the scenarios for the parties. It was your way of avoiding suspicion. A respectable man in his 60s, early 60s, who hosts the cream of Cordona society, cannot possibly be a murderer. But the guests who behave like animals in his mansion, of course, one of them could have killed Fabio. I did oversee a few of the rituals, but I did not stage Fabio's death. The young performer played with your emotions. That was painful to realize. You spent so much time and effort to be with Fabio, but he didn't respond in the way you would have liked. You wanted to be loved, but Fabio shattered your dreams. In the smoking lounge, he teased and mocked you. He wanted you to suffer by offering himself to others. The deception was unbearable. You struck him, and then you staged the ritual. You planted the letter in Vogel's pocket and attempted to set up Matista. What poppycock? Sherlock, stop this game now. There is no stop word, Mr. Manchios. Relax and enjoy it. I'll pass the remainder of this case to Constable Oswald. He'll know what to do with you. I have a name for you. Kurt Manchios. Is that so? The master of the Sabbath? The man himself. Mr. Manchios couldn't stand to lose control over his lover. A deadly revenge that deserves a proper sentence. I have all the evidence to charge him. A degenerate and a murderer. I'll make a name thanks to that for sure. As for my part, not everything was in place. Perhaps some documents were transferred somewhere else, but I couldn't find a trace of them. Then I remembered. 
The discarded document drawers where we put the lost papers or the badly labelled ones. Including the crime scene report of Violet Holmes's case. Everything I've found is on the desk here. Take it. Your persistence has saved me. Yeah, well, we had a deal after all. Your friend is free then. You can leave. Good luck, Constable. Garden. There's a garden behind our manor. How could I forget? That's where it all happened, where it all went wrong. Sherry, it looks like... Oh, you did it, Sherlock! The case is closed and all rewards belong to the winner. Bravo! It is merely the triumph of the truth. Is it? No compromises? No lies? You're happy with your decisions? It was the best decision I could obtain. The truth must be told in the way it is most acceptable. You're making progress, Sherlock. I was right to believe in you. By the way, did you get that precious information about your mother? Oh, not that you must. Yes, I did. Forgive my intrusion in such a personal matter. I simply worry I am failing to be of much help to you. Actually, you were. For some reason, all the archives on the case had disappeared. This was a rare opportunity to obtain the impossible. Outrageous. Perhaps someone found the truth unpleasant. Society usually rejects those who speak with too much honesty, doesn't it? A comfortable lie is often preferred to an uncomfortable truth. Still, I believe that the latter should prevail, and I cannot remain silent. That's quixotism at its best. Your mere truth cannot defeat institutions, systems and power. Etiquette, religion, marriage, they're all lies told to preserve connections, love and sanity, and it's all corruptible. Lies destroy human dignity. How could you make a free decision without any knowledge of the truth? Are we really free to decide anything in this world, Sherlock? I take your point. There are some limits on us all, some compromises we must make. Despite my best efforts, we cannot remain entirely objective. I didn't want to sadden you, Sherlock, only to make you think beyond your boundaries. You're a walking contradiction, Sherlock. You refuse to lie to others, but constantly lie to yourself. How long until the train comes off the track? I cannot look away, but perhaps I should take a few steps back. You're an accident waiting to happen, dear. Until then, I shall bid you adieu. Sherry, Sherry, please listen to me. Sherry. John, I always listen to you. You don't have to do this. You don't have to go through. I don't know what is beyond this door, but I can feel it buzzing, angry, like a fly at the window. I know. I can sense it too. You locked away this memory for a reason. There is only pain here. Pain? And truth? You do not need to suffer either. There is so much more we can do on Cordona, so many others we can help. There is no coming back from this. John, my animum. My brother, there is nothing more important in this moment than this truth. I know you fear for me, but my path was set long ago. I can no more step off it than I can ask the avalanche to roll back uphill. Just... please be careful, Sherry. I love you. Quite. Come on. We'll go together.
Here it is. We'll just borrow it for a while. Did you hear that? Someone's coming. Let's take a peek. You call you this progress? Short. Amateur. I'm not letting you anywhere near my mother again. Any result is progress, even if it is a worsening of her condition. It informs my... No. I have made my decision. She must be sent to a legitimate medical facility. I will not let her hurt Sherlock. What? Master Holmes, you do not understand. That will be all. I expect you to have left the house by week's end. Take me to my flowers, Sherry. They must already be in bloom. As you wish, Mum. I bet you missed the fresh air, didn't you? Terribly. The sun is far brighter than I remember. But I like it. We can walk each day from now on. If you want. That would be wonderful. Just look at them. The stars of the Earth. Even the sky must be jealous of their beauty. Indeed. Mother, would you like to go around the water? That would be perfect. I always wanted such a nice pond in London. It looks so peaceful. Mycroft knew you would like it. We should put some fish in it, don't you think? How about some carp? That's a nice idea. Let's visit your father's tree. It grows so fast, just like you. We could even build a tree house in it. <laughs> yes, Sherry. Speaking of your father, could you call him out, please? Mom! He's... I'm sorry. He passed away. He's gone. No, he's not. I'm telling the truth. Did you forget again? No! Don't you dare say such things! <laughs> you are a liar like all the others! Mother! Don't call me that! You aren't fooling me! No! Mommy hurts! My son would never lie! Mom, stop! Who are you? Reveal yourself! Please, Johor! It's me, Sherlock! You are not my Sherry! Get me my son before I throw you! Sherlock. Sherlock. Can you hear me? Come on, wake up. Get off me. Sherry. You knew, and more than that, you hid it from me. You couldn't bear the truth, Sherlock, so I shouldered it for you. I took your pain, your horror. I... I... I killed my own mother, John. It is unforgivable. It was an accident, Sherlock. 
She was mad, abusive. You were a child, simply trying to help. How could I? How could she? You were a lie, John. A fiction. A crutch. No, I was... I was a friend. Sherlock, please. <clears throat> Sherlock? What? Are you okay? I don't know. I told you not to come, Sherlock. Where is he? Who? Your friend, John. He's beside you. Was all this worth it? Is he worth it? Why, Why is, is he, he here? here? I think, in his own way, he was trying to protect me. A truth I couldn't bear. But now I must face it. There is only one thing to be done. What are you talking about? To expect adherence to the principles of truth and justice, but to fail to hold oneself likewise accountable, it would be hypocrisy. My mother died by my hand. I must turn myself into the authorities and face the consequences of my actions. The consequences of your actions? You were a child. She did this to you, not you unto her. You are throwing your life away in an act of moralistic vanity. Think of all you could accomplish for our nation. This is where we differ, Mycroft. To you, the ends justify the means. To me, the means have decided the end. The truth is the truth. Fine, Sherlock. Walk yourself into the police station and pray those men you oft embarrassed hold no grudges. If you're lucky, they'll simply exile you. If not, I'll see you in 20 years. Are you going to berate me too? Try and talk me out of it? <sighs> As I told my brother, if I cannot demonstrate the character, I chastise others for lacking. Sherry, I think this is something you will have to do yourself. Myself? How do you mean? All I ever did, all I ever wanted, was to protect you from what happened. And now you tell me I was wrong to try that it was ego or hypocrisy to show a young boy kindness. But it was just empathy, creativity, and love for one's self. So please, please, Sherlock, don't do it. Why, why can none of you see it? The truth is the truth. A murder is a murder. Tell me, John, why? Because you're breaking my heart. I know you've decided. I know. I just wish you hadn't. I, I'm, I'm sorry, John. All these years we spent together, all the time I took for granted. You'll always be a part of me. No, Sherry. That's the point. I don't think I will. Why are you here? Closure, I suppose. And to help a friend. You and I are not friends. In a race between the thawing of the ice caps and our friendship, I would buy a moment. Ha! Is that right? I can see it now. I know what you did. What did I do? You... You needled me. From the moment we met, you were 
were searching for weakness, you pushed me to pursue the truth about my mother. You questioned everything I did, everything I believed to... to break me. To blur truth and fiction, reality, morality. A saboteur in silk. Was it vengeance, Werner? Or do you prefer Klaus? Excuse me? You are Klaus Richter, Otto's younger brother. Do you hold me responsible for his end? Ha! There was no love lost between me and my brother. I am sure you can relate. Otto was merely the gravity that pulled me into your orbit. Or you into mine. Once I'd met you, I could not keep away. Why? What reason do you have for all this? To help you. You're lying. To show you that you were wrong. More lies. I know you now, Werner. Try again. To see what had happened. Or is that yet another untruth? Does it matter? Take your pick. Who cares? You're my masterpiece. I turned Sisyphus into Osmandius. You could not see the futility of your quest. Until I helped you to let go of the rock. And now... Nothing beside remains. I remain. Despite you, and to spite you. It is a matter of will and power now. Will you overcome this, or shall you decay? Oh, on that note, I brought you something. I want nothing more from you. When one wants for nothing, Sherlock, the best thing to get them is something personal. So, here you are. Now, please excuse me, but the gallery calls. I'm already conceiving my next project. You really are beautiful. I was prepared to take responsibility for my actions, but again my brother conspired against me. A little diplomatic pressure and the trial was dismissed. Instead, I was exiled from Cordona. Freedom never tasted so bitter. Another perversion of justice at Mycroft's hand. With no means, no home and no purpose, I returned to London. I enrolled at Cambridge University, but few lectures held my interest. I prefer to spend time alone at the hospital laboratory, pursuing truths in chemical form. No one there questions my choices. I have begun to attract a desperate clientele, men that skulk after me pleading for answers to their simple mysteries. At first, the distraction was unwelcome. Now I find myself craving it, lest my mind drift back to the island, to Mother, to John. What was her life worth? How many adulterers and petty thieves will it take to make it right? Can anything? <laughs> I found it! I found it! I found it! And what is that? How far, um, bruises may be produced after death? How are you? You have been in uh, Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? Uh, never mind. The, um, the question now is about bruising. No doubt you see the significance of this discovery of mine. Uh, it is interesting, no doubt, but practically... Why, it is the most practical medico-legal discovery for years. Had we these data sooner, hundreds of men would have paid the penalty for their crimes. Cases oft hinge upon how a man died. Now, we can know which wounds he suffered alive, which occurred post-mortem, and what instrument was responsible. And ergo, one will soon be able to calculate with utmost precision when and where death occurred, sparing the innocent and damning the guilty. Well... Oh. Then you are to be congratulated. Indeed. But uh, uh, you 
came here on business. <laughs> Correct again. I, I am looking for someone with whom to take diggings and heard you were complaining that you could get no one to go halves with you. I have my eye on a suite in Baker Street, which would suit us down to the ground. You don't mind the smell of strong tobacco, I hope? I smoke ships myself. That's uh, good enough. I get in the dumps at times and don't open my mouth for days on end. Just let me alone and I'll soon be right. What have you to confess now? It's best for two fellows to know what bruises each other carries before they begin to live together. My last companion and I... Well, I object to rouse because my nerves are shaken. And I get up at all sorts of ungodly hours. <laughs> and I am extremely lazy. I have another set of vices when I'm well. But those are the principal ones at present. Do you include violin playing in your category for rout? <laughs> it depends on the player. A well-played violin is a treat for the gods. A badly played one. Oh, oh, no, that's all right. I think we may consider the thing as settled. Oh, uh, forgive my manners. My attention wavers. Sherlock Holmes. Dr. John Watson. John? 